get started. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Asha, I'll let you know when when you start. You want me to say something? Yeah. No. no wait. Wait. Uh, yes, Prakash. We can start now. Yeah. Hi, welcome everyone to the Next Generation Technologies. Uh, this is the 14th day of our uh, event. And this is uh, uh, Pandit Madan Mohan Malviya National Mission on Teachers Training, uh, event organized by Ramanujan College, uh, University of Delhi, along with OTF and uh, uh, FROST. And on this, uh, this is for the faculty. It is part of the faculty development program and essentially the penultimate day, I would put it. And in this, we today have a excellent speaker in Malini Bhandaro, who is uh, uh, director at Open Technology, as well as she's uh, corporate uh, uh, woman in technology from VMware. And she's... Uh, IoT uh, open source uh, IoT expert. Previously, she used to work for Intel, and she has over uh, in decades she has been part of the uh, various organizations in open source, uh, starting uh, at least to my knowledge from OpenStack, then into the IoT, then into uh, various other. Uh, uh, what you call the open source organization. Her background is she's uh, she has her bachelor's in physics and math from Mumbai and master's in computer science from IIC Bangalore. She has done her PhD from uh, University of Massachusetts Amherst, and she has been in the research as well as industry right through three decades, starting from her uh, what you call the start starting at TIFR in Mumbai, which is known well known for its research on a beach side, a beautiful place. Same way, she moved to Boston, worked there in a telco like GT, which is uh, now Verizon, and uh, billing software she was working on. She has worked in Oracle on Edox, medical devices on Comrio, and Tufts, which is a big, huge, uh, like Kaiser here in the Bay Area. She has worked for Nuance Communication on Voice over IP. So, the amount of work she has done over a period of uh, years has uh, got her the what you call the recognition and she's a, a woman in technology and promotes a lot of values in open source and women. So I think uh, we, we like to hear from her and our faculty would gain a lot uh, from her uh, overall knowledge as well as the specific knowledge on the IoT. So with that, I will hand over to Malini. Welcome, Malini. We look forward to a long association and it keeps going. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Thank you. Super Thank you. honored to be here today. Yeah, I'll uh, put your slides. Wait, wait. Uh, so let me screen share. Okay. Yeah. Huh, Prakash, I'll share my slides. Yes, Malene, we can see. Okay, cool. Huh? That doesn't look like my slides. Wait, 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 wait. Okay, you can see these slides. Fine, fine. Let me just move this one minute. One second. Sorry, guys. Okay, I'm in business. Um, okay. Sorry. Okay, which slide can you see the the my view or the presenter's view? Hello? Oh, it's a presenter's view. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, this is the now is it the right view? No, the, the previous view? one was the right one. Yeah. My previous one. Okay, okay. Hang on, swap again. Okay. Yeah. So super, super happy to be here today and uh, I just want to share a little something. 
As Prakash mentioned, it's nearly a three decade career of mine. And what does this mean for me? I started doing my PhD in machine learning and AI. I was super excited about it. And one of the things that made me excited about it was like, if you just drew a box with like, you know, a few dots and a few lines, you could look at that box as if it's popping out of the page or pop, or, you know, getting into the page. So it's just the same representation, but a different manner of perception. Uh, and that kind of made me wonder, like, how does the brain think? And then how can we do things without actually explaining and programming everything? Because those were the early days of programming. I would say it's not too early, but it was a time when there was Pascal and you could do recursive programming, which I thought was exciting. And but we were already thinking of these bigger problems. How do we do disease diagnosis? Uh, how do we uh, estimate prognosis of some care and things like that? So we were already thinking nearly three decades plus back, nearly four decades back maybe, how can we make programs better and apply them to real world problems? And I did go ahead and you know work on a machine learning problem for my PhD, and it had to do with sound understanding. But back in those days, um, processing power was difficult to come by, large amounts of it. Storage was expensive. Lots of label data was difficult to come by. So over this long career of mine, I had this opportunity to see this explosion of cloud computing, of cheap storage, of virtual storage networks, and, and machine learning just about everywhere. So as Prakash mentioned, I've worked at many companies, and the PhD was in sound understanding, went on to work for a speech recognition company where they used it in medical applications, and then went on to work at Intel, developing hardware and software to leverage all these capabilities. And today we even have special instructions for machine learning. We have uh, accelerators for machine learning tasks. We have lower precision math for it. So you can achieve different scale and performance with less energy consumption and you know, greater speed. So with that, let's get started. What I want to cover today, uh, brief introduction, what's machine learning? You must already know about it, but I'll just give you a few words on it. And you know, I should later on include a link to Prakash's talk on it. Is this phenomenal, his talk? Then we'll say a little about why we need machine learning operations support, talk about Kubeflow, an open source project, some uses, just briefly touch on commercial and open source, then let's talk a little about machine learning interoperability. And then finally, we wrap up with what's the future like? What do we need to look at? And where should we make some innovations? So machine learning in action. You watch a movie, you like it, you rate it, you rank it. Uh, another two movies and three movies later, they'll say, hey, you know, I think you like this movie with Vidya Balan in it or something. And it's basically learning what kind of preferences you have and other people who have preferences like you, what did they like? And then it starts recommending things like this. So it's essentially doing some kind of clustering. Who is Malni similar to? Her age group, her interest, her, her demographics, which country she comes from, which language she speaks. And then with that, they'll say, oh, I think you like this movie. And so and so, maybe, you know, Usha and Preeti and all liked it. And this is what they liked. And hey, since you haven't watched it, maybe you like that. So we have movie recommendations, book recommendations, vacation venue recommendations, but we're also progressing into autonomous driving, which involves object recognition really fast. You can't have the luxury of saying, oh, I'm going to take like 20 minutes to recognize that there's a pedestrian in front of me, okay? Uh, it has to happen within split seconds and you're breaking speed. You know, if you're at 60 miles an hour, you can't afford to like do anything slow. You have to be watching way ahead of time. There's facial recognition involved nowadays. It's getting better and better. Early ones used to only do good recognition on men's faces. Then they started doing better on 
white men in women's faces and slowly we say, hey, there seems to be a bias over here. It's not doing good on other color faces like purple, orange, brown, black, whatever. Uh, early machine learning was also some simple rules and that was for email checking, but now it's getting way better. If you get a, a message from somebody and then, you know, in Gmail, it'll say, so do you want to say thanks? Okay, uh, let's meet. So it's getting so smart, okay? I mean, sometimes you wonder where you, whether you need to be around even. You can say, you can have the conversation. Early machine learning was also involved with, you know, playing games and those have gotten so good. So just so many, many applications. Okay, so way, way back when there was this man, oops, I didn't give you his name, Samuel. And he was, an early machine learning AI specialist. And he started thinking about the game of checkers and teaching a program to play the game. When you program, you say, okay, if height is greater than this and weight is greater than this, put somebody on a diet. It's a very if then kind of thing, everything we do in programming, but it gets very tedious when you have to learn a lot of tasks. And some tasks, we don't even know intuitively how we do it, okay? Like take driving. Do I always like look at the speed and then when to put my foot on the pedestal, I mean, a pedal and you know press the accelerator, put the brakes. I'm not consciously thinking about all of that. I'm not even consciously thinking about how much ahead I'm looking, what are the other cars doing, what is the speed at which they're coming and whether they might take a turn or not, okay? We do a lot without actually thinking about it. It kind of becomes like muscle memory. Can we do the same with machines was the whole point of machine learning. So machine learning pretty much has three branches, supervised, unsupervised, and reinforcement. I'm not going to go into any of the math, but if you were to go into the math, it's a lot of statistics. It's a lot of uh, gradient descent. And I like to sometimes just joke and say, all of machine learning is search, okay? It's, it's really search. It's search in so many spaces. So let's just take a look at what is supervised machine learning. Uh, use it for things like object recognition. Is there a car in this picture? Is there a person in this picture? Is this a face? Is this the face of Malini that should unlock her phone? Okay, so that's some of the kinds of supervised machine learning where we give it a lot of images of me, myself, Malini, and say, this is Malini, 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 Malini from the side, Malini in the dark, Malini in the bright, etc. Sometimes it also could be about concepts like a whole bunch of people whom we might have given loans to. And some of them have defaulted and some of them have paid it back. What were the demographics about these people? Age group, kind of job, income level, where they were buying the house. Maybe they were young, maybe they were old. So banks do that typically, but if they could have a machine learning algorithm model over there and say, hey, this is a perfect candidate, give the loan. Don't even worry, everything will go fine. So another space, how about like, this was a house and then this was this location, maybe in Pune, maybe in some high rise building. And this is how much it was going to get, you know, like um, sell at maybe a few crores, maybe something else nearby was less. And maybe it was less or more depending on whether it was pre-COVID, post-COVID and stuff like that. So you can even predict the price at which a house might sell. Number of bedrooms, bathroom, location, whatever. So this is the realm of supervised machine learning. But as you can see here, this task of you know, labeling each pixel as whether it's you know, a light pole, a traffic sign, a car, it can get very tedious. So that's another part of it that we'll get to. Then there's unsupervised machine learning and it has a lot to do with clustering. Let's just take a look at the people in a classroom. They might all be, you know, age five to six or something if they're first standard children, maybe they're like 15 to 20, if they're like high school children and so on and so forth. So you could just see in a room, which group of, uh, you know, conversations might happen. The kids might say, hey, let's go get some pizza. Or let's watch some cartoon. The older kids might say, let's go play some throw ball or basketball or something. And the adults might say, hey, you know, let's have a drink. Let's watch some TV, who knows what. So that's kind of clustering based on characteristics such as age, but you can have clustering for all kinds of things, you know, 
how, how prone somebody might be to a disease, how much a house might sell based on where it's located. So clustering is very useful to get some idea about your data. Just throw it, try something and say, hey, you know, there seem to be three groups here or four groups or yeah, there's some outliers. So it's very useful for some initial uh, analysis, but it's also very useful for recommendation systems. Then the last one is called reinforcement learning. And this one's really cool. But with all things, it depends on whether you have a good teacher. And what do I mean by the teacher? So let's just take a look at this. It's, there's an agent, let's say that's me, and I'm learning to drive a car. That's my task over here. And my environment might be a driving ring. And my task is to just drive through that ring, through that loop safely. That could be a, a goal. And my reward function is just to get to that end of that loop safely without crashing. That could be a reward function. Another reward function could be how fast I'm doing this loop. Another reward function could be how fast I'm doing this loop with using less energy. I mean, like not pressing on the gas too much. So going at a steady speed and things like that. So your reward function will dictate how you behave. In real life, that's how it happens. And the best part about this, and I mentioned this earlier, is about driving. I don't think about everything, but if you can capture the state of your world, where you are on this driving loop or whatever, and just some basic physics, if you can simulate, like I'm turning the wheel and I'm going left, I'm going right, and I'm at this speed, so I shouldn't, if I'm going very fast, I shouldn't turn too sharply. I mean, that's a crash kind of material over there. If we can capture some of that information in a simulator, uh, what happens, the crash or the you know acceleration, and you put it in with your reward function, your agent can learn. This is like dynamic programming, and you can get to a point and say, hey, you know, if I reach this state and I'm at this point in this track and I'm going to make this sharp turn, next thing is sure crash. So I can back off from this point and say the reward function here is zero and then go on and go on and slowly learn about this environment. But why is this important? Because real world environments are complex. It's hard to make if then rules for everybody for this. And the tracks change the car changes. So there's so many variables like this. You don't want to do all this manually and program it. But with all things in machine learning, you do want to generalize. So after you've trained it on one track, you want to take whatever that agent's learning is, that model, and move it onto another track and another track and train over there and then get this, this model that can work on any track. Like you and I go get a driver's license, but are we really driving to every place on planet Earth before we get that driver's license? No, we're just learning some basic skills, okay? That's exactly what we want to do with the model. And I had a blast doing some reinforcement learning on the Amazon SageMaker platform. There's this uh, program called Depressor, and we could choose a vehicle, how many speeds it has, and then start learning on one track, apply it on another track. And what was super amazing is this was all in simulation. But when we moved it to a little car and programmed that car with this model, it did pretty well. It didn't even crash. And when we were training initially, we were doing things like 40 seconds for a loop. At the end of the training session, we managed to get it to under 12 seconds without crashing on a real car because we had it on a real track. So there's so much power to simulation and machine learning and being able to do it. And I am not the best driver, but my car could start driving well. So with that, we've established where we use machine learning. We've talked about different machine learning uh, methodologies from supervised to unsupervised reinforcement learning. So, hey, are we all set? Actually, no. It turns out that in the big picture that we have here, the machine learning algorithm part is this itty bitty little orange piece. There's so much other stuff around it, okay? So it's got to do with your infrastructure. It's got to do with collecting your data. It's got to do with analyzing your data. It's got to do with training it and then keeping track of your models and saying, hey, is the next model better? Is the previous one better? Should I use that? It's got to do therefore with evaluation and also eventually monitoring that model for drifts. And then 
definitely using it in real life. Let's just take that example of the house prices, okay? So what if I had trained some machine learning model to predict house prices? And let's say I put it in there. It turns out that with current COVID situations, lack of materials, hard to find employees, I mean, workers to build stuff, the housing market is actually pretty strong. It turns out that the prices haven't dropped. In fact, they're going up and there's stiff competition. So what if you had predicted that a particular house sitting in say Mumbai, Malabar Hills or whatever, uh, you're going to sell it for five crores, let's pretend. But if you put it on the market five, five crores and somebody offered you five crores and you sold it without looking at the fact that the other neighboring houses if you'd kept your old model pre-COVID, we're selling for five, six, seven, eight, nine crores. I mean, you're the loser then. So we need to monitor the model, this prediction thing, say, oh, so I'm predicting it'll sell at five crores. But wait a minute, somebody else sold it for six, somebody else sold it for seven. So if I am your agent, I should not recommend five crores as your starting point. And eventually after all this, of course, I should update this new model into my prediction system. So if I'm the real estate agent, I should be seeing all the other stuff that's going on. So actively learning and then update the model. So the next customer comes, I can give them a better estimate on what they should put their house on the market for. Okay, so this is really why we're talking about machine learning operations because there's so much around this space, okay? And today you have a certain set of data, like I said, with the new houses that are selling, that's additional data. You need to add them into your data collection over here. You need to do any other processing. Let's say with object recognition, you got to find the boxes, you got to label them, you got to say, where's the face, where's the traffic light, where's the car, where's the pedestrian? So there's a lot of work involved. So, is it tedious? You bet it is. There's large volumes of data you need to train. After you train, you've got to test, is this model performing well? You've got to explore maybe different model architectures. So with decision trees, okay. With clustering, how many clusters? One cluster, two cluster, what is the distance metric I'm using? What is it that I'm gonna do? Just k-means clustering or hierarchical clustering, so on and so forth. And then with parameters of anything, let's say with K means, am I looking for two clusters, three clusters, 10 clusters? What is it I'm trying to say as a threshold for actually acceptable cluster definitions? So that's the space of hyperparameters, okay? And then eventually after you've done a bunch of learning, you'll say even if it was something as simple as K means and clustering for unsupervised learning, you'll say, I think the model that performed best was the one with six clusters. So you had to have checked maybe two clusters, three clusters, four clusters, so on and so forth to have arrived finally at the six cluster model. That's the best. And that's the one now you could keep all your old ones and then say, I'm going to deploy this number six cluster model. Okay. Then eventually what happens once you deploy it, let's say it's a facial recognition program. And let's say it's in the cloud somewhere. And let's say it's because of its COVID, we want to just check that everyone's wearing a mask. But if there are more banks and more railway stations and more hospitals where we want to check and they're all going to this cloud endpoint, we need to scale it. More places are opening up, so we need more recognition models out there. So this is what we mean by scaling your deployment. And we already talked about monitoring your model. And then finally, you have to update your model whenever you change it. So. What's your typical machine learning pipeline? You have to process your data, okay? If it's like object recognition, you have to like do your bounding boxes, you have to do some edge detection, maybe some blurring, maybe some color analysis, you know, brown, white, black, whatever, those edges for nose, eyes. So that's the part that we call as data processing. So you first load the data, you verify that everything is in there. You might have to split off some for, training, some for testing, then you actually do all this edge detection business, any other processing. Maybe you even have some feature engineering, okay? And by this, I mean, let's just take another example here. I want to check how constructive conversations are in, let's say, open source. Then I might want to see uh, how quickly was an issue picked up. 
How quickly was somebody responding when I asked questions? Did somebody offer me some example quotes? That would be a constructive thing. So these could be like features that I extract. Okay, as opposed to just analyzing the text of whatever somebody had written in a comment. So with that, what happens is the data processing itself has so many steps. Then you choose your model. You know, with deep learning, there's like convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks. There's so many, okay? So you choose your model, then you actually train. And remember we discussed about hyperparameters like with k-means how many clusters the same thing can happen with deep neural networks okay in your model architecture how many layers will you have what will be your bias functions what will be your learning rate uh, what is the size of your epoch how many samples are you taking how many are you throwing back or retaking you know it's like a sample and sample with put back without put back all those are criteria that fall into your hyperparameters, okay? Eventually, you take that test data and you validate your model, and then you serve it somewhere, that's called inferencing, and then the other part is the mon model monitoring. So that's just a typical pipeline. And rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat. You've got to do this many, many times. As you get more data, as you want to try new models, maybe somebody has a new uh, archive paper that says, hey, this is this new thing that you want to try. And so you'll take that same old data and start training with a new model architecture. So this will be a rinse, repeat. Let's do this many times type of thing. So we, we get the best model that we can have. So we just mentioned why machine learning ops we mentioned what a typical machine learning pipeline of flow is. And with that, we say it's non-trivial and the open source project Kubeflow addresses that. So it's all about a scalable, portable, okay? Scalable, why? Because it's going to run on Kubernetes and in Kubernetes, you can scale your pods, you know, just a deployment. You can always say how many uh, pods you want in your deployment, min, max type of thing, that's scalable. It's portable, why? Because it's all containerized, so you can run it on any infrastructure, any cloud, okay? And that also holds for Kubernetes. You can run it on any infrastructure, a Google cloud, an Amazon cloud, name it. And it's a distributed machine learning platform because some of these tasks don't always have to be on the same node. And you might have GPUs, you might have FPGAs, you might have some special purpose hardware accelerator. So what are the projects inside Kubeflow? Okay, so this project called Arena, it's a command line interface. Why is that important? Not everybody is going to be Kubernetes savvy. Not everybody even knows how to handle a GPU. But if you could use a GPU, you would like to use a GPU. And this also brings us back to who is your typical user, okay? So you have a data scientist who looks at the data, understands the data, thinks about all kinds of things about the data that I, I'm just an operations person, I would say, I wouldn't even have thought of. So I was one time looking at some anomaly detection data. And this was like part of a hackathon or, 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 you know, like a competition. And they had just row upon row, like 4 million rows of data. And there was one field that says UDP, TCP, ICMP. And like, I know enough about networking over all these years of working in this space. I said, I know what that is. The data scientists did not know anything about it. It was just amazing. But the data scientist in question said, hey, this field is only taking three values. I have some options here. I can take a numeric value and say one, two, three, but remember what happens when you do one, two, three. If you say something is a three, you say, oh, it's further away from a one. But there was no implied order within ICMP and TCP and UDP, okay? So when you go and use a numbering system, you tie yourself into and you fall into pitfalls of distance, like in clustering. But actually there is no relationship here. So he says, hey, you know, I can use one hot encoding. I can put, you know, like a binary representation, zero, zero, one, one, zero, one. I mean, one, zero, zero, that sort of stuff. So that's the realm of the data scientists. They can think of different ways of encoding your data, putting the features to highlight, to see what kind of range there is if I want to do quantization, et cetera. 
but that data scientist might have no clue about Kubernetes and infrastructure and machine learning operations and pipelines and blah, blah, blah. Okay, so that's where Arena helps. Somebody can pretend they're on a standalone single machine and still get the power of Kubernetes when they deploy it. So fairing is a way of encapsulating and serving your models. Then there's Kubeflow pipelines, which was the whole point of the whole ML ops. The care serving part is how I serve a model from a registry. I can take a model from a registry and serve it in any framework and I can scale it up and down. I mean, under the covers, it can therefore use the other you know, Kubernetes scaling operators. Katib is a project for doing hyperparameter search. So when we were doing that deep racer project, when I was like, oh, this car can drive better than me type of stuff, it was a lot of this sort of experimentation. Um, how many speeds should I do? How should that reward function be? Okay, and I, we kept tweaking that reward function, trust me, to get it down from going through that loop, you know, in 40 seconds to 12 seconds, we messed with that reward function. We said, should I use speed? Should I use angle of steering? Should I use uh, distance from the end goal? You know, you wanted to reach the end goal faster. So you would give them a little more points for like going in the forward direction as opposed to backward direction. Do you want to give points to how close you're to the median of your track? And it turns out a real racer doesn't care to be hugging the middle of the track. I mean, hugging the middle of the track is really good to avoid crashes, but a real racer will say, hey, let me take straight lines. You know, in a curve in that track, let me go along the straight lines by making it like a piecewise linear approximation type of thing. And that will shave off distance that I drive and therefore I can get there faster, okay? So Katib is that project that will help you do this hyperparameter tuning. And this comes back to my earlier joke. All of machine learning is search. You're searching in the parameter space, essentially. So this one is all about uh, the MPI operators about map reduce kind of search, uh, reduce and combine kind of solutions. And Kale is a helper project. It's really cool because it lets your data scientists use Python notebooks and then say from this Python notebook, this is how I want to analyze the data. This is how I want to see the data. And now I want to try maybe some scikit algorithm for clustering, or I want to do some deep learning. And then I want to deploy. So you can go from notebook, which is some traditional stuff that a data scientist traditionally uses and go from there to a Kubernetes Kubeflow deployment. So what might happen in a simple pipeline, okay? Uh, you download and you split your data. Remember, splitting is very important, training and test sets. You do not want to corrupt that part. And then maybe you want to train two different kinds of models in two different architectures. And there's some merit to doing that. Why? Because um, if you've heard about it, it's called adversarial attacks on your model, okay? Some models, some types of models might be vulnerable to certain types of attacks. There's a very good example for this. You have a stop sign and then you stick a little tiny label and though it was a stop sign, it might read as a speed limit or confuse the machine learning model. So you might wanna have more than one model from a different family of models. So you build in some resiliency. So you don't get you know, cheated or, or misled by some, engineering of the input data. So in this case, the simple pipeline says, hey, I'm gonna build a decision tree and I'm gonna build a logical regression algorithm and then combine the results. You'll see this word also coming up and uh, they call these ensemble models. And you could have maybe multiple decision trees or multiple different types of algorithms and then take, let's say you want to like identify cats. Uh, and they have five different models and you'll say, I'm taking the majority vote. If they all say dog, then it's a dog or if three of the models say dog, then I'll call it a dog type of thing. Okay, so how does a typical pipeline look? Um, it might have some parallel components like this picture says. It might have some serial components like do this, then that, and that typically do this, then that may happen with the feature engineering or some uh, data, you know, like partitioning, like, you know, test set and then training set. So you have the language in 
cube flow pipelines to specify this sort of thing. They're the operators, like put parallel sign and then you know next sign, whatever. And you can see your graph, what your data analysis graph is going to be like. And each of these can then become a little uh, container and run and you can monitor these and you can see is there any failure? Has it completed? You can rerun experiments. So Kubeflow Pipelines has a user interface so you can specify your pipeline, specify an experiment, like some data that you give and say run, and then you can monitor your runs when you maybe change something more and so on and so forth, okay? So now this is just providing you a whole bunch of links and resources about Kubernetes Kubeflow and the license is Apache V2. It's a Google run project for the most part, but there are several contributors. I myself am involved with it. I very, very newcomer to Kubeflow, you should say from a developer standpoint. Uh, I've just got one tiny patch and it, it was with uh, Kubeflow serving. And what happens with Kubeflow serving is we wanna be able to support uh, retrieving a model and providing it from inference regardless of where that model resides. So it could be sitting in an S3 bucket, it could be sitting in somebody's um, MongoDB or any such thing, or in a container registry even, because at the end of the day, it's just a binary bunch of bits type, right? It's a blob. So uh, my patch had to do with S3 support. And then uh, an important thing about Kubeflow is because it is a open source project and it has a bunch of people working on it and there are several projects, there's a little difference in opinion on how you should branch, how you should tag, what's going into a release, what do you do when some of your features aren't yet ready for the next release or the quality of the release is not so awesome, you might have some bugs. So I've been involved with the release work group and as a member, I'm working towards the 1.4 release, helping define the pro process, uh, lock down certain things like deadlines and, and release process and negotiation for deadlines, et cetera. So any skill is a valuable skill in, in open source. It's not always about development. If you're a good documentation person, you've got good skills with language, please feel free to join a project to provide additional documentation. Who's the best documenter? Somebody who's run into trouble. When you're trying to use a project and it doesn't work, you file an issue. And then maybe after you've solved it, you yourself can fix the issue by updating the documentation, et cetera. So there are many tutorials and you can even use uh, um, Cataconda. So you can try this. You can definitely try Kubeflow on your own system uh, using Minikube or in Docker. So there are many ways to get started and warm up. Of course, you can't use a GPU in the standalone only on my laptop or desktop type of thing. So that means a slightly more advanced setup, maybe your uh, card so that you can use a cloud provider's uh, infrastructure. And with that, what can I say? Uh, there are also commercial offerings. With anything open source, I mean, it's like you have to do a lot of grunt work maybe in debugging issues, etc. But it's all yours, it's free then, and then you've got the experience. But there are also commercial offerings. And what do the commercial offerings do? They not only give you the software, but remember it won't be the bleeding edge because you know it takes time to always catch up with the bleeding edge, but they also give you infrastructure. And so the Googles, Amazons, Alibaba, IBM, et cetera, have their own cloud infrastructure with FPGAs and GPUs and other hardware accelerators. There's also a startup called Arecto, which is very, very active in Kubeflow. There's Domino Labs that offers a machine learning platform, but it's a little expensive. But if you have a full-time data scientist, you know, heavy user, it's worth it for them. And there's also Databricks, who's been very active for many years using Spark and AI. Okay, so we talked about machine learning pipelines and why we need Kubeflow and blah, blah, blah. It's, it's tedious, it's error prone, you wanna be able to duplicate it. But what else can we say? This machine learning landscape has a lot going on. What do I mean by a lot? Is Kubeflow the only framework for machine learning? No. Uh, 
We've heard of TensorFlow from Google. So that's a deep learning framework. There's Scikit, which supports all the classical machine learning formats like you know, clustering, linear regression, you name it. And then there's PyTorch, there's MXNet, there's CAFE. So there are all these other things. And these have also come from maybe some big companies like Facebook and you know, not just Google. So with this multitude of frameworks, let's say I learned a model and I want Prakash to try it. And let's say I learned it in TensorFlow. So Prakash either has to use TensorFlow itself or he has to say, you know, I don't want, really want to work with you. You know, it's not easy to collaborate. So it's a collaboration pain point. Or maybe I have an account in Google and I have it with TensorFlow and I have built my model and he's on Amazon and he has a different format. How does he take mine and use it in his? So we have this plethora of model frameworks. We also have a plethora of hardware that we can run these models on. So you can have CPUs from Intel, from AMD, whatever, you know, they're x86. You can have ARM CPUs, they're ARM servers coming to. You have GPUs, you have FPGAs, and you might even have some teeny tiny microcontroller that does some very fast object detection. Like if you have a drone, and you don't want it to crash into some mountain or the electric pole when it's going to inspect something, you don't have the luxury of putting one big FPGA or GPU over there. It's something small, but it's purpose-built. So when you build a model, given the multitude of frameworks and the multitude of hardware, I mean, you have like a huge multiplication there, right? I mean, A times B and it just goes on. So this was the same problem that we had seen long ago with Java. What did Java do? It said, hey, let's have an intermediate representation. And Java was all about, uh, you know, write once and run anywhere. So you wrote it and you compiled it to this intermediate representation. And then when you dropped it on your Windows machine or your Linux machine or whatever, there were some binaries over there, .so files for your Linux machine that would take that bytecode and then you know, just execute it, okay? So the runtime was possible there. So that's essentially the same thought process here with Onyx. And with that, let's go to Onyx. Onyx is an open neural network exchange format. Open, it's nothing proprietary. It's, it started with neural networks and you know, it's, what's a neural network? It's, it's just a graph and then there are nodes. And then, so the nodes you describe has a, you know, a threshold function. And if some, some activation at that is above that threshold, you say, hey, this node fired, okay? So it's really basics like this. It's just obvious that whether you've learned it from PyTorch or TensorFlow or something, once you put this graph representation in a manner anybody can understand and say, hey, you know, it's just like a protocol for networking. Uh, anybody can communicate with anybody. And that's the power of Onyx, okay? So it was started by Microsoft. 20 plus companies are involved. Obviously the hardware vendors will be involved because they're the ones who know their hardware really well. I remember when I was working at Intel, every generation we brought out new instruction sets and we sped our own crypto algorithms, you know, whether it's for VPN or IPsec or secure hash, because we knew which of those uh, instructions would, you know, do better for us there. So the hardware vendors, can take this model representation and compile it to their hardware. So just keep a compiler and the compiler would be provided by the vendor of the hardware. So let's say I'm on a Kubernetes cloud and then I have a CPU and let's say it's from Intel, I'll just use the right compiler for that. Or if it's a GPU, I'll use a GPU compiler. And then if it's NVIDIA's, I'll say, fine, I'll use theirs and so on and so forth. So the, uh, the hardware vendors have contributed compiler optimizations. And uh, what else can I say? This makes the life of collaboration easier. So if I'm a researcher, I can put my model in the Onyx format, hand it off to uh, Prakash, and he can run it on whichever cloud he wants. And he can even improve upon it because that's all the point of transfer learning. How, what happened there? Okay, let me do this back. 
Okay, uh, I want to say something else with compilation over here, this part, uh, Onyx comes with its own runtime and its own compiler. It's working with MLIR. There's also another one from the university, I think University of St. Louis or Washington, Washington. Uh, they have a compiler called TVM. They also have a commercial product on that called OctoML. So, this is a hot area. Of course, this is an area where you might have to know quite something about compilers and definitely be part of the hardware vendor landscape to know their special instructions. But one of the beauties of TVM is it's trying to use machine learning to optimize your machine learning compilation. And we've seen this even with code optimization in normal compilers. So LLVM is a project that both of them use. This is a long time open source project. Okay, so what does this make for us? Uh, it makes for us an easier life for collaboration, exchange, et cetera. Onyx today supports several formats. So it does the scikit-learn, which is really good. So it does not only like, you know, deep learning, but also traditional machine learning. Paddle Paddle is also a company, I think it's Baidu, no, Paddle Paddle. They contribute also to Kubeflow. So there's plenty of action here. And I think this was the right way. This is the same way of going about things. So what does this mean for us? You can learn in any framework. You can save in the Onyx format. Then you can use your Onyx runtime. And then you can deploy your model based on whatever hardware you have or you need. And these deployments can happen for whatever edge cases or cloud cases you have, okay? And typically some edge cases, they can be big edges or small edges, you know, there's a whole uh, scale of edges that are there and life gets easier. Another very important thing is with these models, you can even request a certain level of precision. So like, hey, you know, I, I don't mind dropping from 94% to 90%, but shave off maybe a few layers in your neural network to save on time or to save on compute resources, et cetera. Maybe that's good enough. So there's such optimizations possible, you know, if you're ready to give up some accuracy type of stuff. So with that, what's next? Uh, with all machine learning, there can be some dangers too, because what if you haven't trained with enough data that represents the scenario? Early on, we mentioned about facial recognition and the early facial recognition used mainly men's faces. They were white men faces. Then they did go on and add white women faces, but they weren't doing good on recognition of darker skin faces. And even with dark skin, there's a whole range of colors. I mean, it's it's not just black and white there. It's like so many shades of brown, so many shades of cream, blends of these, etc. So if you say, hey, you know, I'm going to do good facial recognition and you provide a model like this and there's Joy Baluni who was at MIT, she was doing her PhD there. She's done some phenomenal work in this space and she noticed that if she wore a mask, she would do better, okay, on the recognition system. So that's about fairness and fairness also, you want to avoid biases, like maybe this poorer person has taken a loan and returned the money, just don't ding somebody and deny them a loan because of their income level. So you want to be fair in even like paper analysis to accept for a conference. We do all this double blind evaluation, right? So double blind, single blind, et cetera. So the next things with any AI is about better AI than what we started with. We want to have fairness. We want to have explainability. And I seriously don't know how to explain something in neural networks. It's like something fired, something this. But that's there for the space, the frontier we want to make improvements on. Like, why did somebody get a loan or why did somebody get a denial of a loan? You want to be able to explain it. Otherwise, it's there could be bias just the same way. You know, I think this person is going to be a criminal. I want to punish them. Why? If you had a racial uh, situation, say, hey, this person's dark. I don't want to give them money or something. So we want fairness. We want explainability. And we want robustness. And we alluded to robustness earlier with having maybe multiple models and being able to safeguard 
you know, certain vulnerabilities using multiple models. With that said, as part of Better AI, the Linux Foundation has uh, uh, like an umbrella called LFAI and data. And some of the projects and some of the issues it's looking at are reproducibility. Uh, this was there with any experimental stuff in the old days, even with any scientific endeavor. Some researcher will say, hey, you know, I solve diabetes. This is the medicine you take. Or, hey, this is the way you clone your cells and you make some new genes and then you have this sheep that's super healthy type of stuff. But that's not science. Somebody claims something. Science is when you can take their recipe and reproduce it in your lab. You can do an experimental design. You can hold things constant. So we want to do something similar with machine learning call it reproducibility. Given the same data, given the same random number that you use to split your test and training data sets, maybe you said you know, 80, 20 or whatever, and even maybe saying the same algorithm, let's take for the example k-means, I should be able to produce the same exact cluster. So there should be no magical tweaking. Long, long ago when I was teaching, uh, we had some Huffman coding program and the students already were aware of the sample test case they were going to give them. One of the students brilliantly put a print statement and the, the unencoded statement is hello world or something. So <laughs> that's not science, that's not programming and that's definitely not machine learning type of thing. So when we say reproducible, we should be able to recreate the model and be able to get the same kind of ratios with you know, recognition accuracies. Why is that important? Because let's say I built a model and had some suggestions. And let's say Prakash takes it tomorrow and says, hey, I'm going to improve on, on Malni's deep neural network algorithm. I'm going to do something else with the training ratio or the epoch set or something. How does he know he's improved unless he was able to reproduce my exact results and then apply his tweaks and then get a better model, and then you know better accuracy. So it's important for science. And I think this is accepting that machine learning is matured enough that we can treat it as a science, not as some magic or art or something. So it's about reproducibility, about robustness, about equitability. Like, if you do not want to use machine learning algorithms tomorrow to deny somebody some loan or some healthcare or some treatment or, or not give them the right treatment if it's personalized medicine or whatever. So you want to have equitability that how do you do it? It's, it's all like bias. Like, have I covered enough black faces? Have I covered enough brown faces in the spectrum of browns, etc.? So you can do things like look at your data, analyze its distribution, et cetera. So privacy, it's not that it's okay to just take anybody's data and then maybe leak you know, their personally identifiable information. You want security of your models, like especially models that have to be trained constantly to watch out for you know, drifts, et cetera. So security of those models. You don't want somebody to like inject fake data and then train your model with this fake data. You do not want somebody to replace your model with another model. So something that we do with you know, any software is we start signing it, right? So there's a notion of here's a model, I've you know, flattened it up into bits and bytes, and then I want to sign it. So there are all sorts of things. The transparency was with respect to you know, explainability. And you know, there's I feel it's three different ways of saying it, but that's kind of the way they're looking at it, really deep. And with that, I conclude and I'm open for any questions. Thank you. Hey, Manani, excellent uh, talk. We have five minutes. And so what I'll do is I'll start with the most toughest question to you first. And the toughest question that comes to my mind is, I heard from Dr. Omar Khan that uh, in quantum computing, we cannot measure. And you told that if you cannot measure, you cannot improve it. So I'm stuck with the uh, will, uh, will uh, Qflow or whatever the AI machine learning will ever be able to improve quantum computing. <laughs> Looks weird to me. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, well, you know, machine learning is not working at the quantum scale. That's one thing, okay? Mm -hmm. So we can definitely measure 
uh, how many, uh, you know, like test cases it's passed, how many it's failed, and we can at least do that. So let's say you and I have a model and you took my model and you got a, you know, like say 80% accuracy and then you improved upon it. We can definitely test and compare if we use the same test set and training set and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's not get into quantum <laughs> computing yet. But another very important thing that you mentioned with quantum computing is it's very different from traditional computing. And we'll mm -hmm. have to kind of like comprehend how we move today's programs to the future or how we convert quantum computing to something akin to today's computing so that we don't have to reinvent all our programs. So that's a whole new ball of wax. Sure. So coming back to the ground now, uh, huh. basic things, what the... Uh, faculty wants to know is where do I start for a uh, machine learning as well as for the platform which you mentioned Kubeflow. Okay so when you want to get started I think Kubeflow standalone is super cool. Start with that simple tutorial. They have one just like um, here use your laptop a single node standalone Kubeflow pipeline type of thing. Then you use a data set uh, the traditional ones that they do like, you know, hello world type of thing is using some iris data set. They're like some three, four types of iris classes. That doesn't do it for me, but why bother with these silly irises, especially if you haven't even seen that flower. There are many, many data sets and they're all public. Uh, they're open. I wouldn't even bother to go first round to some image recognition because there's so much more involved with object detection, image recognition. Do something very, very simple. Start with clustering. Can I find out all the people who might like to watch, you know, Gandhi or, or some movie? And use simple stuff like feature vectors, you know, age, height, blah, 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 and then stuff. Then you get a feel for using machine learning in the context of one of these pipeline things. But even before that, if you're super new to machine learning, don't even go there. You can use notebooks. Notebooks are Python. Uh, you can download your data set from there. You just give the URL to that public data set. There's even a data set for how many women CEOs they are, by the way. Grab the data set in your Jupyter notebook, pure simple Python code. Use this pandas library. Then in the pandas library, you can do data frame and say, hey, show me the columns. Uh, headers, show me the first 10 rows. So you can start getting a feel for the data and pretending to be a data scientist. And then let's say you say, I want to do clustering. Now, what's the next thing I'd say? This is super basic. You feel I've done some machine learning and given some data, you can say, will this person become a CEO or is this flower a iris or whatever, whichever problem you solve. Then let's say you had huge volumes of data that's when you feel like, hey, I need a machine learning pipeline. I need ML ops. So that's when you say, let me look at Kubeflow. And then remember we talked about, you know, KLN notebook, that same notebook you can upload into your standalone Kubernetes Kubeflow, you know, like platform. And then you say launch it. And then you say, hey, I did it in my just simple Python thing. Now I can run it in in a Kubeflow environment, but what did that tell you? It's like me driving in the, um, you know, apartment complex or my gated community, wherever I live. But the fact that I went around and I didn't crash says now I can go outside that compound wall. And that's essentially, and say, hey, you know, and I'm scaling. I'm not just going to go around 10 circles around my school or my apartment complex, but I can go from one side of Delhi to the other side. And that's essentially what the power of getting into Kubeflow does. It says, hey, I've gone outside the compound wall. And then, hey, I'm driving across the country means scaling with more data, more algorithms. And this scikit has even one auto ML kind of business. So not only will it try uh, decision tree and then XG boost and blah, blah, blah. It'll try a bunch to try and improve on your machine learning model automatically just given whatever criteria. So it steps you through each of these. So definitely start with a Jupyter notebook, then use scikit-learn, 
collected data from some public site, okay? And then you start getting comfortable and then say, hey, now I want to scale to more data. And that's when you want to look at Kubeflow. Excellent. So we are 1030 on top of the hour. Uh, what I would do is at this time, uh, yes, uh, I think I should thank you. And uh, why not? Thank I, you. I, was, I was thinking of question on security, but let's leave it offline, uh, especially because scalable AI is one secured is another. So security aspect, we can talk later offline. But uh, we have another gentleman waiting here, Vivek. Uh, okay. Speak. So I will thank you so thank much. You, thank you very much for the uh, very, very uh, whatever uh, energetic and very explanatory, very bottom line explanation, which we heard from you. People will now be eager to put their statistics into it and all their equations and all. Let us see, hope they can do it with all the differential equation and whatever they have at their display. Remember, all our machine learning is just search. Bye. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Take care. You can you can stay and listen to other folks, but I will uh, uh, mute you. Okay. Thanks. Mr. Prakash, I think you're muted. Sorry, I, I was muted. So I had to uh, present myself again. So let me start with the uh, next one, which is Vivek here. No, this is not Vivek. Uh, this is not Vivek. Yeah, OK. Uh, voice gateway, this is not the one. Welcome to day 14, session two. Uh, we, we have uh, Vivek Hariharan and he is uh, currently working as a data scientist and engineer at san francisco bay area for uh, indeed.com and utilizes his experience in machine learning and nlp he has eight plus years of professional experience a masters in computer science from university of illinois at chicago following a bachelor's uh, which he did uh, at Anna university in chennai his past experience include building and deploying machine learning models on aws cloud stack and uh, for he was uh, part of the ad tech company uh, Tube Mogul, which is now acquired by Adobe. And he, he experiments with contextual bandits and ad for optimization and working with data at scale using Spark. He likes to keep tab on the latest research in AI and ML space and occasionally speaks at events. This is probably his second event. And outside of his professional career, he also finds uh, exploring nature and working on uh, making his home smarter. So he, he is a, what do you call a smart, uh, smart, uh, he looks for smarts in his home, like using Alexa's and those, hey Google types, uh, switching on off lights and all. So his area of expertise includes AI ML, NLP, ML Ops, ML Infra, AWS, and Cloud. And today he's going to speak about uh, natural language processing or NLP. Here we go. Take ahead, go ahead, and you can. Uh, I'll give you the control. Uh, you can take the control. Can, can you control? Uh, let me see whether you can take the control. Yeah, this. Do I stop you... sharing? Yeah, I'm stopping. Go ahead. Okay, can you see my screen now? Oh, one sec. Uh, 
Yeah, I think uh, it is yours is coming. Okay. Yep. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm Vivek. Uh, today, this because this is a 30 minute talk, I'm trying to I'm going to try to introduce some parts of natural language processing in the context of just uh, text. So let's get started. So there are a lot of AI applications um, that we as end users have come across. So there are, computer vision is one part of AI, and we all know that Google has Google Lens that allows us to search uh, using images or video. Um, speech recognition or like audio recognition is another part of AI, um, which I think the app called Shazam actually allows us to recognize um, songs or um, jingles. And obviously um, home speakers and smart speakers like uh, Alexa or Google Home are also getting, getting us closer to that vision of artificial intelligence, which allows us to actually have conversations with them as well. So for the purpose of this talk, um, we're gonna use like text-based chatbot as an example. Um, I think a lot of you might have come across uh, chatbots that allow you to buy stuff or um, in this case, actually book flights um, instead of actually having to talk to a human agent. Um, and yeah, we're just, I'm just gonna introduce a few NLP ideas or topics based on this. Maybe a little bit slower, lower the voice. I think it's okay. Let me move it back. Okay. Um, so the early chatbots were actually based off of rules uh, using pattern recognition. Uh, Eliza was uh, a chatbot developed back in, in MIT back in 1966. Um, which was actually developed as a psychotherapist um, after analyzing uh, transcripts of the therapy between like patients and the therapist. Um, so Joseph Weizenbaum came up with rules and codified it um, in the, so that uh, it appears that the chatbot is actually uh, as close to a human as possible. So one of the important tools of identifying text patterns back then at least was regular expressions. Um, and I think a lot of us as computer scientists know that regular expressions are the language used to identify patterns. And um, for as an, as an example, if you wanna try to identify uh, all forms of woodchuck, um, you would probably come up with the rejects that somewhat follows this pattern. So you, the red, regular expressions themselves offer brackets to uh, pick one of many letters or uh, numbers. They allow for ranges to denote like all the different possible ranges, uppercase, lowercase, um, numbers, alphanumerics. Um, there also uh, allows us to do one of one or more, zero or more an optional character. So if the question mark is the optional character, allowing us to handle uh, English languages in different countries like the British uh, and the US. Um, star language allows for zero or more characters so that you can capture different uh, slang uh, elements, plus is like doing that same thing, but one or more. And dot is just like one character. Um, and also to denote like the beginning and the ending of a sentence or a word, we use like the carrot and the dollar sign. So the other aspect that Liza uses is substitutions. Um, a lot of people, or if you've come across uh, this Linux uh, program called SED, which is like the stream editor, it allows you to actually do edits. Uh, and even in the uh, Vim editor, it allows you to do edits like this. So when you have your source regex pattern and the substitution pattern. So that example uh, there is trying to substitute the British spelling of color with the US spelling of color. So ELISA was actually a combination, was built basically by using a combination of regex and substitution. Um, and it was, uh, an early attempt to try to imitate a human therapist. Um, an example at the bottom is uh, patterns that match I need X would be res uh, responded with, what would it mean to you if you got X? So it sort of feels like it's an actual therapist talking to you and arguing with you or having an argumented conversation with you. So some of the sample rules that were used were like, 
something simple as any sentence that had I am depressed or sad would be responded with, I'm sorry to hear you are, uh, and, and so on. So there are like a bunch of examples, rules that um, sort of come into play. And this is an example conversation and you can see how it's sort of close to human interaction. It is. So like, if you look at, hey, he says I'm depressed much of the time. I'm sorry to hear you're depressed. So it definitely has some element of, you know, human intelligence built into this program, which is actually um, still artificial. So definitely Eliza is the first attempt at trying to create a, a bot, um, but it's definitely a tedious version of creating a bot. So it actually involved going through transcripts of uh, the psychotherapy, coming up with rules that would sort of mimic uh, like, you know, a conversation as well as like, uh, this is a good condition of, or this is a good example of cases where it sort of seems to work, but there definitely uh, doesn't happen all the time. So as time went on and as advancements in machine learning also happened, uh, there were additional tools that allowed us to build more sophisticated um, like chatbot or artificial intelligence systems. So parts of speech tagging is one such tool. Um, us as humans, I think, as we're learning a language, uh, learning parts of speech is one of the critical and early steps in learning any language. Um, so th this is trying to also give this metadata information to computers as well. So um, this part of speech tagging is uh, is now a somewhat of a solved a supervised learning problem. So it's basically the art of assigning a part of speech to each word in a sentence or text. Um, and just to reiterate, I guess the different parts of speech tags are uh, your nouns, your verbs, your adjectives, adverbs, and so on. And this is an example of an output for parts of speech tagged output. So given the text, each word is tagged based off of the closest parts of speech. And this additional information given to a computer allows it to interpret patterns in, in a more, uh, in a similar way to the, the way that humans do. And parts of speech tagging actually is uh, now considered more of a like pre-processing step to any NLP test, uh, just to allow the computer to uh, get that additional piece of information and not just like text. So it allows, it improves like parsing of the data um, in cases where there's like translation happening or uh, machine translation of uh, one language to another. Um, identifying or making sure we know what the part of speech is allows us to uh, substitute it with the right word in the other language. Um, sentiment analysis is definitely another, uh, where uh, you have to know the where the adjectives are and try to make out if the adjective is talking positive or negative about the particular product or um, the person. And text-to-speech as well. So uh, English and a lot of languages actually have similar words being pronounced in different ways based on context. And knowing the parts of speech actually helps with uh, the pr right pronunciation. There are cases where parts of speech sort of sometimes fails as well, um, especially in slang. Um, so knowing the part of speech does help in most of the ways, but it also might not help in certain cases where there's like slang involved or a word is being used in a different way. Um, and like I mentioned, the like parts of speech is, is a pretty um, accurate uh, supervised learning approach right now. It's uh, close to 97% accurate right now. And, there isn't that much research happening to improve it further, but um, the existing algorithms are typically two classes. Um, um, you have the supervised machine learning algorithms um, where uh, just a short recap, I guess supervised machine learning is giving examples and allowing the model to actually learn um, from those examples. So you have like the classic machine learning algorithms, which are like the Markov models or the conditional random forest, where humans actually have to create the features and then have the model find like relationships between the features and the, the output versus more uh, modern uh, deep learning slash like neural net based uh, approaches, which actually doesn't really involve that much of a um, feature engineering or more human intensive like feature engineering process. It uh, helps the model just learn by itself. Um, the other uh, tool or metadata is name density recognition. Um, similar to parts of speech, uh, the, in order for the computer to know named entities, uh, 
like where named entities are things like person, location, organization, or like geopolitical entities. Uh, it this context definitely adds value in when it's try to trying to parse the intent or uh, the text that it's been given. Um, again, similar to parts of speech tagging, uh, name entity recognition uh, is not as accurate as parts of speech tagging, but at the same time has similar methodologies in which it's tra it's trained. Um, similar supervised methodologies are used to uh, try to uh, identify named entities uh, based off of like, like labeled data sets. So up to now, we've talked about like more old school uh, chatbots, um, but more recent chatbots are actually quite sophisticated. Um, and it actually involves multiple components of um, like in the system itself. So the methodologies that we've talked about so far mo most likely fall under the natural language understanding component. So basically trying to parse what the data is and tagging it with the right pieces of information uh, to actually parse what the question or statement might be. Um, the, the lookup part is more or less structured in the sense uh, it might get translated into a SQL query. Um, and then the output of the SQL query needs to be messaged to the um, user in, uh, in a human readable way. So the message generator part is like the final part. In order to uh, talk about the, the last part, um, I'm going to introduce like the language models. Um, so probabilistic language models are, are basically uh, models that predict how likely a particular sentence uh, happens. So in a way, it's similar to how the human brain works. So you've seen a pattern of words happen in a, in a in, in quite a lot of time that you you sort of automatically know that if a given sentence uh, is started and the other the, the the rest of the sentence is missing, you sort of know what to auto complete it with. So um, similar to how the human brain works, uh, the computers have this notion, and we call it the language model. And uh, it's simplified as uh, the, what is the probability of a particular word uh, to follow the, the previous sequence of words. And the early were in cases of language models actually relied on a Markov assumption. So it was it is really hard to actually use the entire context of a particular sentence to predict what the next word was. So a simplified simplification was to actually only take into consideration uh, a, the previous word or the previous two words uh, and predict your next sequence of words. And this family of uh, like models were like based off of the number of words that you use, uh, we're called uh, n-gram models, or in the first, the simplest one is called the unigram model, which given a corpus of data, it tries to identify how likely a particular word happens. And based off of that, uh, if you ask for this uh, language model to spit out a particular word, it'll spit it out based off of some uh, probabilistic uh, likelihood. So these are like random words uh, that it spit out. And you can see that there's not much of a relation um, between each of the words. Uh, the next step in this is like the bigram model, which uh, it actually learns the probability of two consecutive words happening uh, together. Uh, and you can see sort of this, uh, the, the words that are being generated here are slightly more like uh, structured in, in like a sentence format, so like especially the second example here, outside new car parking lot, there's some sort of relationship within the sequence of words. So the more mo uh, modern like forms of language models are actually neural networks based. Um, and the neural network models actually uh, are performing much better than the ngram based models. So the, uh, they make use of simplified feed forward um, like deep learning models. Um, and like they allow us to learn uh, better than the ngram models because of um, the similarity between words that it gets to learn. So this is an example of a um, deep learning feed forward network wherein each word is translated to an embedding format. And just to give context, um, an embedding is a vector representation of a word. Um, and there's an entire class of uh, learning called representation learning, which um, you could, there are methodologies like word to vec to try to translate your word into a vector representation. And that vector representation sort of is 
um, allows us to identify words that are similar. So um, in that visual, in that virtual or like the vector representation space, you can identify similarities like cat and dog lying close to each other or king and queen sort of being like close, but like in opposite directions and so on. So um, because of the vector representation, um, we get to identify a lot more uh, like correct patterns instead of the like ngram model, just like hard coded to just being that specific word. Um, but yeah, uh, the neural language model is the latest uh, and greatest right now. Um, and most recently, um, last year, OpenAI, uh, which is uh, an organization of, uh, trying to build open source, uh, like pre-trained models, came out with the GPT-3 model. Um, and that's the most uh, recent like language model that is being used for all sorts of different applications. And um, if you get a chance, you should try to look at some of the demos that they have and, and, and see how they're being used in different uh, spaces. Um, so where are language models being used? They're actually being used in quite a lot of places. And um, the early phases of language models were actually being used for um, autocomplete in Google search or any sort of like text-based um, res responses. They're, they're being used in like spelling uh, correction or grammar correction, uh, just to make sure that you're doing the right thing. And more recently, um, I don't know if you've come across any of the smart, smart compose uh, features in, in your email clients. And they basically allow you to start your word and like automatically complete the, the email for you. So um, yeah, again, to reiterate, uh, using a bunch of older school like techniques like regex uh, to identify patterns or parts of speech type to extract the right parts and language models, we're trying to, we can start making more sophisticated um, conversations agents or chatbots. And a lot of these abstractions are, are in place such that users don't really have to start from scratch. You can build on pre-trained language models or even like the GPT-3 model and build on top of it and make your model customizable um, and more accurate to your domain and space. So this is like a short overview of like natural language processing in the context of using chatbots. Yeah, that's all I had. Thank you, Vivek. Uh, so uh, great presentation on the uh, NLP. So the one question comes to mind is the GPT-3 you have been mentioning. So mm -hmm. will it be, uh, I, we run this, let's say, event, and we have to uh, send response to each of you, thanking you and all that. Can it uh, do it for me if I give you something like that? Example? Yes, it, it definitely can auto-complete. What, like? what would be the process? Just to try to understand at least how it does. Auto yeah, so, so the GPT model is actually trained on a large corpus of data, so it has seen all sorts of text, uh, pictures, images, and so on. So the all you have to do is sort of start one sentence or so, and it sort of, it, it customizes to that uh, context. So um, in a way, if you start out a thank you email, it will probably auto-complete it minus your named entities that you want to thank, but, um, but yeah. Interesting, that's interesting. And anything you want to share uh, for people who want to work on uh, NLP specifically? Yes, so it's definitely uh, domain-based. Um, uh, and natural language processing is definitely fast. You can think about speech as well as natural language processing. Um, for text-based, there are a few libraries like NLTK that sort of provide a lot of these tools that I talked about, like the parts of speech tagging. Um, they allow for sen sentence detection and so on. Um, Stanford has quite a few resources. A lot of the slides that I use is from the Stanford course. Um, they have uh, another, like I think they have an AIM entity recognized library uh, and, and a few other like libraries that you can also start out with. GPT-3 is the newest thing. Uh, it's, it's still out and a lot of people are trying uh, to use different things and pre-trained uh, deep learning models are definitely 
I think the way to go uh, if you're thinking about building something your own. So uh, starting with a pre-trained model and customizing it uh, to your use case might be a good experiment to start. So I'll throw it open to uh, people here. Malini and uh, Gokhale, do you have anything to ask, uh, Vivek? I don't see anything on chat, so go ahead. Oh, that's fine. I think it was a very wonderful presentation. Uh, thank you, Vivek. You did my job easy. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Malini, what about you? Are you there? Okay, I think uh, if we don't have any questions, uh, we can end it early. And, uh, and well, thank you very much. And uh, especially with a short notice, you come up with the uh, NLP stuff and uh, we'd like to continue on this uh, evolving in the future and yes. uh, appreciate your time and uh, and you can stay to listen to yeah. one more speaker here. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. So Gokhale, uh, I will start yours now. Uh, I'll check your slides. Yes, to... Prakash. Yes, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll just uh, share my screen. Yeah. So you share your screen and introduction I had to give. So uh, can you share with is you? my video yeah. coming up properly? Yeah, absolutely perfect. No Fine. Problem. Okay, good. So let me just uh, share my screen. Mm -hmm. uh, can you just enable uh, uh, screen yeah. sharing? Please? Yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, uh, see whether I'm sharing. Yeah, multiple sharing is allowed. So how did the uh, uh, Vivek managed without my enabling that? I don't know. Maybe if you're logging from the US, things will work out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. So, okay, good. Uh, give me a minute. Yeah. yeah. Can you see my screen? Yeah, I can see your screen. This is not so, my screen. This is not my screen. Then? Okay. okay uh, yeah, this is your screen. Uh, can you see my screen? Yeah, Wait. I can see. Very nice. Okay, then uh, uh, let me just get started. Yeah, just before uh, you start, uh, you hold, hold on there. Let me introduce uh, first uh, you. So yeah. I, I will need something to do. I may just uh, override you for something for a second. Yeah, so let me go with uh, text based key flow. No, this is not me. This is you. Okay. Why sex? Yeah. Okay. So let me just uh, share this. No, present this and then come back. So welcome, uh, Professor Gokhale, as we call you, and also uh, you lead a, a, what do you call the SMD of Intelligence ASP India and focused on research in IIoT. So what we know about him is he is uh, partly academic and partly industry and he does a lot of experiment. His students are worldwide and he's from Mumbai and a lot of pioneering work he's done in electronics and communications, Linux, embedded design, IoT, gateway, data structures and algorithm is his forte. He holds the MPEG CS from IIT Bombay and he has worked his way through microprocessor SDKs and industrial design on software optimization for chemical built in Thane. And he's a, a low cost solution uh, expert, we know. Uh, his tenure with Bombay University still continues in Bits Pilani and other uh, academic institutes. Uh, he was the one who wrote uh, the JDK 1.2 uh, course for the uh, uh, sun, so sun uh, in 2000s and he's an embedded arm OS expert with Raspi. He does a lot of tricks which others will uh, find it interesting because his embedded expertise is actually a good one and which he uses. And he's also the founder and president and brain behind our Open Technology Forum, uh, which uh, we have now named as Emerging Open Tech Foundation. And this is a big step and uh, we salute him for that efforts and bridging the gap between India and the global technical community. So patience is, is hallmark and very quite humble and no nonsense guy. So let's give him the handle to uh, present his 
the work on uh, gateways and especially iot gateways thank you go ahead welcome Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Prakash, for this wonderful introduction. Uh, I do not know whether I deserve so many sweet words, but it's nice to listen to these nice sweet words uh, sometimes. Uh, incidentally, my topic is not on IIoT gateways, but my focus is uh, essentially into bringing in voice into such gateways. You know? uh, for that, I'll be looking at a bunch of uh, voice oriented architectures. And in that context, I'll be talking about virtual assistants. And uh, I got really uh, dragged into the uh, looks and feel of Almond, which is a, uh, I should not say it's a product, but you know, it's a wonderful solution that has come out from Stanford pretty recently. And because it is open source and it has a slightly different architecture compared to Alexa's or the Google's, uh, I thought maybe this is some promise. So what I'm going to do today is uh, uh, essentially a very, very simple 101 treatment, I should say, you know, in case people are there, freshies, uh, this is uh, targeted for that. You know, I'm a professor by nature, so I normally tend to get down to the grassroots level of uh, any particular topic. So that is exactly what I'm going to do. And uh, Vivek has made my job uh, wonderfully easy. He has given a uh, quick fire introduction and completely identified the entire pipeline of natural language processing more from a text uh, context. So I'm going to add on to that from the voice context. And sometime earlier, we had Dr. Kannan speaking on uh, speaking tutorials, a wonderful initiative from IIT Bombay. And that is uh, a model which is uh, delivering uh, audio content in a pre-formatted manner uh, in a structured way across uh, different type of uh, topics and subjects uh, primarily meant uh, for uh, the students. And he's already built in a wonderful community around that. And uh, that's a, a lovely product to have. So once again, uh, that's a wonderful initiative. I'm not going to talk about any initiatives or I'm not going to talk about real hardcore technologies which I have contributed. I'm just only looking at, you know, how I have really ventured into uh, these technologies. And I just wanted to tell you the fact that these technologies are good to use and pretty easy to use as well. So my talk would be centered around give a brief introduction to uh, virtual assistants or we now call them as voice assistants. And I will go through a quick uh, generic architecture for any virtual assistant. This is uh, once again proposed by a um, guy uh, called as Manning. Manning has uh, come up with a nice comprehensive book, which is more or less like a reference book. So I picked up information even from this uh, Manning's book. And I'll be also talking to you on Almond as an Almond from an architectural point of view. And I'll just give you some idea about what Almond is all about. Now, once again, this material for Almond is uh, sourced from Stanford University publications and a few uh, lectures and a bunch of uh, uh, what do you call product technical documents on Almond. And in case there are any questions, I'll be happy to take that. So I'll take about uh, maybe an hour or if at all I'm getting uh, sucked into this uh, session, maybe I'll take a few extra minutes too. Okay, Prakash, you can just uh, interrupt me whenever you feel that I'm uh, exceeding my time. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Fine. So let us understand uh, what is this impact of voice? Now, typically voice is uh, identified as the new interface for interaction, right? Uh, we know uh, we have essentially voice which is used as an output. Most of the applications which are mobile applications have a small speak out button. And the moment you click on that speak out button, it typically converts your text content into uh, spoken uh, sentences. And that's how you can listen. You know, it becomes easier for you to maybe uh, hear to your messages while you are driving. And uh, extending that, even mobiles have a support of uh, a scenario wherein you, know, you can just drive the mobile to perform some activities by giving voice inputs. So voice is uh, essentially used for both inputs as well as outputs. And uh, when you look at the content, the entire content is, as of now, audio. 
now uh, is it now possible also to mix other modes of uh, the multimedia uh, that is uh, something which we still uh, being worked out and i'm sure in the next 3 to 4 years that also will typically come up into a usable form you also have got a lot of uh, solutions which use voice as a intermediary uh, primarily for your navigation you know you have navigation services where the routes are spoken to you so you don't even have to look at the map directly follow the spoken instructions and navigation is very much possible you have got uh, voice based lookup services voice based inquiries and now even uh, shopping applications are uh, looking at implementing voice based solutions you also have got assistants uh, like your normal chatbots uh, these assistants are now not purely going to be text based assistants now they would be essentially voice based assistants so whenever you go on to any particular uh, site to pick up a insurance policy the first thing that happens is you know, a small chatbot pops up and then it greets you and then gets into an engagement trying to help you out in purchasing the insurance policy right so when you talk about voice uh, we can identify a, a voice which is typically i call it as voice 1.0 the first generation of uh, voice based applications and most of these were uh, interactive voice response based uh, applications so ivr based applications so what is this the ivr essentially uh, handles a series of interactions with the user in a pre structured manner you know so it poses a bunch of menus and these particular menus are once again structured depending upon the activities and the actions so it is something like a small a tree of uh, menus and uh, they set up a hierarchy of these menus and the menus are how, what are actually used for interaction with the users and what about the responses the responses are also primarily pre structured responses anything beyond this is normally reflected down into moving this entire conversation into a physical uh, personalized uh, uh, agent out there maybe a telecaller and the telecaller will essentially take up the call from there so 1.0 has uh, been really good it has uh, reduced a lot of burden in terms of inquiry services customer support services and so on and so forth and the entire technology is primarily based out on implementing structured conversations which are built around clearly defined vocabulary and please understand this vocabulary is also domain specific so we say that this uh, vocabulary is not a general uh, vocabulary it is in the context of that particular area it is in the context of that particular domain of an activity so the semantics are also pretty well defined and also the action rules are also defined what do you mean by action rules these identify what is the operation that you are going to carry out next in the context of the information which you have received now right so these are action rules and the voice 1.0 typically it was not purely context dependent and that is one small uh, topic of voice 2.0 and there we now move down to voice 2.0 uh, implementations so first and foremost thing is what to have access to multimodal content so it need not necessarily be content which is purely from just voice you know you can just get a mixture of information from various uh, services which are there for you maybe some of the services are available as web services you collect all such information and then aggregate and then you know generate some outcomes with these outcomes once again could be voice based or they could be text based or they could be message based or they could be video based or picture based or whatever so essentially what you are trying to do is you are just trying to have a multimodal content and that is now the so called future Right. for example you can just set up a very simple rule which says the fact that you have uh, achieved a milestone and that particular milestone can be automatically reported onto your instagram page and that can be typically uh, done and uh, that is a very classic example of how you have a multimodal content automated by an agent Secondly, for the voice 2.0, we say that the context is reasonably fluid. It's not a context. The context is to be understood. Context, context tends to be dynamic. Context tends to be based on uh, sentiments, and context 
tends to be based on you know, the slang and the local vocabulary. You know, all of that has to be now merged together to generate a meaningful outcomes. And so that is a very big challenge also, once again, for Voice 2.0. And the third uh, pointer for you know, Voice 2.0 happens to be a collaboration of a bunch of services, right? It has to collaborate with messaging services, mail services, uh, web services, which perform a bunch of activities, you know, social media services, uh, talking to appliances and devices and so on and so forth. So what we normally now say is, any point where a service can be executed is now modeled as a device. So your Instagram is a device. Your Twitter is a device. You know, your, your mail services and Gmail happens to be a device. Your thermostat is a device. You know, microwave oven settings are devices. Carriage, car garage door is a device. You know, so you don't need to really talk in terms of the so-called hard devices and the soft devices. All these are devices. So that's how you bring all of them to a common platform in voice 2.0. So here comes now the concept of virtual assistants. Now virtual assistants were uh, sort of being used in uh, process automation and the automation industry. These were essentially called as robotic process automation tools, RPA tools. And what are these RPA tools? Uh, very much like you have got these uh, 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 hard robots or hardware robots, you call these as software robots. And these software robots, loosely called as bots, perform the so-called routine tasks. So you pre-program them, you define when the task is to be performed. These are called as triggers. And upon a trigger that is occurring, the RPA uh, wakes up and then it performs the required task for you. Right. So, so very simple routine tasks can be delegated to a RPA. And this is uh, very much being used in the industry, uh, especially in the context of availability of digital forms of data. The so classic examples happen to be, you know, form fillings and automating your mail replies on conditions, uh, evaluating resumes, which are uh, typically sent out to organizations to the HR department, you know, and you can just trigger uh, an activity based out on some event that uh, essentially happens and so on and so forth, right? So you can just integrate a bunch of services and then automate them and put up a small workflow around these activities and then create a automation process through a RPA. So these are acting as assistants. You know, these are basically uh, workflow assistants. Now, the question is, these are all automated on some activities and some data points which are available in the enterprise. Now, we are not talking in terms of adding voice capability. Now, what do you mean by voice capability? The moment you add voice capability, you typically talk about an assistant, which is a virtual assistant. Now, this can even converse. That is what we are talking about. So, the entire interactions now would be purely uh, spoken interactions or speech-based interactions or voice-based interactions. And once again, the responses that are elicited from such systems also happen to be voice-based responses. The essence is, how do I ensure the fact that the responses that are generated are meaningful? The responses that are generated are contained within the context of the application. Now, this is something very, very important. So we really require the so-called uh, virtual assistant to train using a small training model, uh, maybe using a neural network. And uh, the training is to be imparted in such a manner that the responses that are generated is meaningful and to the particular context. So there are a lot of ways by which this can be typically implemented. We will talk about those things a little later on. So the entire crux is based out on speech processing, both the recognition as well as the generation. Recognition is from the user's input, I understand, and then somehow act on that. And the generation is a scenario wherein you generate uh, audio outputs to the user. Okay, so to do this, the intermediary happens to be your NLP. In the context of NLP, we talk about natural language, both understanding, processing, as well as generation. So all this will, will fill up the actual 
pipeline. So let us typically now talk about uh, the virtual assistants. What can they do? So they can do a lot, many things, you know, very simple, nice, beautiful tasks. They can be instructed to do either in a pre-programmed manner or a one time, or maybe, you know, they can schedule them to wake up at a particular uh, time or when an event occurs and then a task can be accomplished. And what are these tasks? like uh, taking dictation or reading emails out for you, looking up on uh, your contact lists and uh, making a phone call and scheduling some activities and so on and so forth. A whole bunch of applications are very much there. Once again, that depends upon the context whether these applications have to be personal applications or device in, uh, related applications or in the context of business applications. We have uh, existing uh, solutions. Uh, which are Amazon's Alexa, you have got Apple's Siri, and you have got Google Assistant, and also Microsoft Cortana. All the big four have uh, invested a lot into voice, invested a lot, really a lot, you know, a few billions are invested into voice because they see voice as a great market. And there was a recent report from Google wherein they say that adding voice to their marketplace has uh, somehow brought in 55% uh, more interactions with the users, right? So that is some sort of a survey report that has come out from uh, Google. So what is uh, the current generation of uh, virtual assistants or voice assistants? As of now, they are used to perform some very, very simple tasks. You, know, you can just give a small uh, query and that particular query would be understood and a, appropriate response would be generated right uh, so you can just program uh, the va or you can just instruct the va to perform some activities now or probably schedule some sort of an activity not only that these vas can uh, handle maybe interactions with a whole bunch of other additional elements which are uh, in its control we'll talk about what do you mean by in its control a little later on so what are the ways by which you have this? Now, natural language is to be uh, integrated into the automation task. That's what I was trying to tell you earlier. So this is not an easy job, you know, uh, very simply because if you talk about just a very simple command oriented action, that might still be okay. But the moment you talk about even a command, which is a little more uh, complex, uh, it takes a lot of, uh, energy for the system to understand uh, the meaning of it and then try to uh, coordinate and synchronize with multiple services. Now, for example, this is a very, very simple query, which is very easily understood by us, like turn on the air conditioner whenever the outside temperature raises four degrees above the room temperature. The moment you talk about this, you know, it is a very simple uh, query for uh, humans, but this same thing uh, translates into a very complex set of services which have to collaborate and interact before an appropriate action can be taken. Similarly, is the second scenario. If there is a motion detected on the security camera after 9 p.m., call the manager. You know, this is a very simple rule, uh, which you would like to have it as a uh, service. And if this has to be implemented, uh, just notice the fact that there are a lot of integration of services that have to be uh, set up. So these tasks appear very simple, but where the very, very complex, simply because you're not talking in terms of multiple contexts. You talk about a context uh, which is local, then you are talk about a context which is outside of your environment, then you talk about a context which is still not completely known to you, offered as a service to a, by a third party. You know, you have to really understand various contexts so that the response is now meaningful and consumable. So um, you have got a whole bunch of uh, application services. The moment you talk about personal VAs, so you have got uh, all these services like you know, scheduling meetings and appointments, getting navigational information, sending out messages, making phone calls, setting up reminders and asking some very simple questions, read out of uh, your content of messages and mails and so on and so forth, right? So you have got a whole bunch of these services and please notice the, all these services uh, along with search capability uh, you know, gives you an immense 
power. So that is where you know Google is actually trying to integrate voice services with search services, voice services with uh, mailing services, messaging services, map services, location services. You know, integration of all these services is definitely going to be a very uh, groundbreaking type of uh, 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 VA services that can be offered to people. So let us understand very briefly what are the voice assistant types. The first type is what are called as QA types. You know, QA is uh, you just pose in a question and uh, that guy generates a response. So a simple question like what is my bank balance now is a question and then you get a response back saying that your bank balance is so much. Or you could have a dialogue. You know, dialogue is normally a two-way communication. A communication actually carries out before some sort of a meaningful outcome is generated. Right? This is a dialogue is normally established to solicit more information from the uh, interacting agents. So could be something like this. I've got a slight temperature. Then you know, suddenly the uh, system comes back to you saying that do you have chills? Uh, then the response could be, yes, I do. And then the dialogue can continue before a final outcome is actually what is generated. So these are what I call as dialogue-based voice assistants. Or there could be command and action. A command and action is something like this. You know, primarily these are rule-based, right? Uh, this is like, if then do this type of a, a rule base, right? So you talk about this uh, uh, command and action, which is very much used more specifically in automating processes. It could be something like that. Whenever I get an email, which is an inquiry email, which is marked urgent, send in a quotation with the actual corresponding product brochure by email. Now, this is a very simple statement, appears very easy, but you know, there are a lot of things which are still uh, uh, fuzzy, I should say. Right. If the inquiry is, you know, that is something which I need to understand a little more. Marked urgent is something which I can typically clearly identify. Send in a quotation. You know, what exactly is the quotation? Is it a standard quotation or a discounted quotation or whatever? With the product brochure, which products? I have to identify what is the product which has been inquired upon and then pick up the product brochure relatively to that and then create all this sort of an action statement you know so it is not very very simple and straightforward saying the fact that the moment i get a mail generate an auto response it's not just that okay and iiot or iot is another uh, area where voice assistants are really being uh, used thanks to a lot of uh, devices and appliances which are used in the home automation environment and most of the home automation environments are typically based out on gateways, the so-called IoT gateways uh, or home automation gateways. And you have got voice assists like Alexa and uh, Google, which can also directly talk to them, right? So you can just set up some sort of uh, commands, which uh, go something like this. Shut down the packaging unit after the batch is done, right? So what, how do you know whether the batch is done or not? So there is another context, which I need to understand to know whether a batch is complete. If so, I need to in work a appropriate method so that the packing unit will be shut down, right? So it is not very simple, even though the entire statement appears uh, so. So what is the crux of this entire working? First and foremost, you capture natural language as an input. Then you use the entire NLP pipeline, which uh, Vivek uh, spoke to us, and that will identify all the basic structures. It will identify what exactly are the semantics of that. Uh, then you talk about uh, understanding the uh, uh, outcomes from the semantics, and that has to be used in the context of some AI models. These AI models are essentially neural network, deep learning, uh, recurrent network type of uh, models. And uh, based on these models, you identify critically what is the best output that you're going to generate. Maybe best text you're going to generate or in the context, what is the best response you're going to generate. And this could be directly converted into actions. You can drive some actuators out there in the context of a control-based environment or probably you can generate this as a wise response, give it back to the user. And mind you, 
all this has to be done in near real time. So that is something which is pretty interesting. So this brings into the concept of doing all these activities at the edge. So if at all I can implement these uh, activities at the edge, you know, I have got uh, something which I can prove and then I can bring in maybe, you know, uh, automation, smart automation driving towards industry 4.0. So this is a generic architecture of any voice-based system. I have uh, information about each of these uh, blocks out there. So I'm not really getting into the details because Vivek has already gone through that. The only thing is what we just typically add up a small block out over here called as a speech to text conversion block. This uh, typically takes the speech input, which are coming from maybe some microphone or some sort of a audio capture device. And that gets converted into uh, text. And for that, it uh, essentially uses uh, automated speech recognition modules. And these are based out on creating a phoneme list and then trying to identify what exactly we call it as a chain link of all the phonemes and uh, identify appropriately what the word is more likely to be. And that's how words are created and a series of words will make up uh, uh, sentences. So, Essentially, the outcome of this is what is called as an utterance. Utterance is just nothing but a list of all the spoken words. It could be a sentence, it could be a paragraph, etc. All that would be the output. And once you have got a text-like representation, then you typically give it to your regular NLP uh, pipeline. And uh, the essence of this NLP pipeline from the context of a voice-based system is this dialogue management. So I'll be talking a little about dialogue management and this dialogue management will understand a the context and based out on the context or the intent, it will identify uh, based on the current inputs and probably the previous inputs it has received, it will identify what should be the uh, output response that it needs to generate. Now, the best part about this dialogue management is it also makes use of personalization. A lot of personalization is uh, really required. And that is the crux of the so-called learning concept, right? So the dialogue management is not a very simple uh, if then uh, type of a rule, but it has to be based out once again on a neural network, a learning model. And obviously the outcome of that would be a natural language generation. The output could be in the form of uh, some sort of a semantic structure. And that particular semantic structure uh, can be used once again by a natural language generation engine to create the output. And the output uh, by the natural language generation primarily could be in the form of a text output, which is once again given to a text to speech converter, a text to speech converter uh, essentially uses concatenative speech generation, where it takes small uh, audio snippets and then combines them together. And at the point of combination, it just runs through a small low pass filter and it just smoothens it out. And that's how you generate a smooth and audio output, right? So this smooth and audio output mimics a particular uh, personality. Uh, and uh, oh, the only problem is it is uh, lacking emotions. You know, everything is reasonably flat and you know, uh, diction is constant, the speed is constant and so on and so forth. There is no emphasis on emotions, right? There is no emphasis on the way modulation happens. You know, modulation brings in a bunch of emotional content that is once again, not, res not right now there. And maybe that will also come up very, very soon. So I've got a few slides which actually talk about the same thing. So let me skip on to uh, what uh, we mean by uh, the personalization. You know, remember I told you this dialogue management has to be centric towards uh, personalization and personalization is all about remembering and retaining the context. Now, for example, if the question was, what's open now, uh, the user profile typically has to be maintained in the way that these are the most frequently asked type of questions, the most frequently asked type of topics or the recent topic, you know, this sort of information should be uh, stored and maybe an appropriate uh, response should be generated. In the context of the what is open now, 
uh, the system should understand the fact that he is talking in the context of restaurants, not in the context of maybe a departmental store or not in the context of a petrol pump or a service station. Right. So also uh, knowing the fact that this user's uh, interactions over the uh, past is always in the context of a location, closeness of a vicinity, the system can understand that, keep this information, and then it can generate an automated output, which uh, typically talks about all the restaurants which are open in maybe a kilometer of a vicinity. So close to me is automatically taken up as a activity, as a parameter, as a property, as part of the user's profile. Okay. Uh, the only problem with this user's profile on personalization is about exposure, right? Privacy exposure, as we call it. So when you talk about personal profiles, you are not talking about your VA having access to your likes and dislikes. VA having access to your uh, personal information, like your date of birth, your birth dates, you know, your family details, and maybe also even your bank related details. Right. So please understand this personal information is exposed and that is uh, one small point of a vulnerability, what we normally talk about. Right. Uh, understand if at all I'm using VA for a shopping related application, this vulnerability increases. Right. The other uh, area where you talk about uh, using this uh, dialogue management is bringing in this interaction. Multiple services have to be brought together. So how is this done? A sentence like this, order for veggie delight pizza and get it delivered at my home by 2.30 p.m. is a, a command which has been spoken out. Obviously, I can just uh, decipher these commands, bring out the tokens and do lexicon analysis. And then when I create maybe a semantic uh, meaning, the semantic meaning is not a very simple straightforward meaning. I have to now use the context information. The context information tells me the fact that the moment I say veggie delight, it automatically means the fact that I'm, uh, uh, I'm actually uh, talking about an eight inch thin crust veggie delight with extra cheese, no olives, right? And when I say delivered at home, this home is meaning the fact that the address is already known. My home address is known to the system. Order typically invokes a simple mechanism wherein I try to make a payment. And the moment I'm making a payment, I already have uh, had a mechanism wherein I told that I need to make the payment using my credit card ending with the last four digits of 3210. And by 2.30 p.m. means the fact that I would expect this pizza to be delivered at home by 2.30 p.m. So appropriately, I need to identify what is the lead time to place an order. And that has to be computed by uh, negotiating with the um, pizza houses. And then I need to appropriately place the order, maybe at 2 o'clock or 2.10 or 2.15, depends upon the information that is available from a different set of service. So collaboration is now a very, very important tool. So a lot of backend activity also has to be there, which uh, ensures the fact that the service is rightfully delivered. So as I told you, this is my dialogue manager. Dialogue manager is actually responsible. And uh, one essence is that it is responsible also to interact with the outside world. And the moment it is interacting with the outside world, it is taking my personal credentials and then probably, you know, as an agent, handshaking with the outside world. Right. So there is something which I need to understand how much of information goes out and what information cannot go out. Right. Uh, so this dialogue manager also needs to have a clear idea about how it can talk to other devices and other agents. Right. So it has to have a lot of information, more specifically contextual information, personal information, and uh, information about all the devices surrounding you, information about all the devices to which you are actually uh, interconnected and stuff like that. We really do not have to worry about this NL generation or the outcome of uh, the uh, uh, DM, a dialogue manager, essentially would be a semantic structure and that particular semantic structure would be processed by the NLG engine and that fellow will generate a 
simple text outcome once again using a neural network and uh, this outcome is uh, spoken by my tds engine right that's my tds engine okay so uh, having said that uh, vs and iot's are now uh, combined their roles and responsibilities so there's a good convergence which we see so it, IoT actually started off with a very simple phenomena wherein I have devices and those devices can be uh, triggered using a mobile phone. You've got simple applications wherein the application actually sends out a, a trigger either through an SMS or th over a, a IP network and a command is given to perform an on off type of an action, right? Most often. And these sort of applications are there and very simple and very easy to implement. The same thing is there in uh, the context of your, uh, your uh, uh, let's say home appliances, whatever are there, you have got a home assistant and the home assistant essentially will have a hub and that particular hub acts as a control hub and uh, you can uh, control all the appliances which are registered under this particular hub, right? So all these activities are IoT related activities and uh, how can you now provide even a better interface? You can make better interface by using uh, voice-based uh, interactions. And the moment you bring in voice, best thing that you will have is a complete hands-free and voice-activated mode. Okay, so it's purely a UI which is triggered by hands-free operations and you screen-free operations as we can also say. Okay, <clears throat> so we know IoT essentially connects to the things around us. So I say that IoT connects to the thingy world. And if this uh, thingy world is available as smart elements, which offer smart services, these elements can be understood very well by my uh, dialogue manager. And the services can also be discovered by my dialogue manager. And appropriately, voice-based interactions now can be enforced on these smart devices, offering smart services. That is the bottom line of it. So here, uh, is it very difficult to build in a, a voice application? The answer is a big no. I have got a very small 200 line Python program incidentally got developed by a student of mine and he just took about uh, two to three hours. A lot of resources are available. This is a, I would say, a not even a level 0 0.1 type of a version for a uh, voice application. I call this as Anita. So, and this is a no frills application and it works on what are called as tag words. So whatever the speaker speaks, it will observe and then identifies and picks up a particular tag word. And that particular tag word is treated as a command and that particular command would be executed. Right. So these commands are once again pre-programmed bunch of actions. So you can just bring in more complexity into the way the commands are understood. And then you can typically give a mesh of uh, actions that can be performed, uh, interconnected, collaborative set of services can be implemented. So let me quickly show you a small demo of that. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very simple uh, demo, uh, which is a Python code. Uh, most of it is also available. Uh, you just do a Google, uh, you'll get a lot of uh, these sort of codes and I just added a few additional features. This is a 200 line uh, Python code. We call this as Anita and I can just invoke that. The crux of this entire thing is once again, a recognition engine, a speak recognition engine. And that speech recognition engine uh, tags on to your devices, uh, audio source and then you know whatever the spoken sentences will be converted into a text form right so this is a small function called as a get command function wherein i use the speech recognition engines uh, audio source which is a microphone my system microphone and then set up a small uh, listener uh, that particular listener will listen onto the source and then generates an audio and this particular audio uh, is uh, converted into a text using this recognize underscore uh, Google. Now this recognize underscore Google, you can do it in two ways. The, I'm using a library uh, which is uh, called as uh, PyTTSX3. This uses 
SAPI API. SAPI API is once again a speech API which is available and it uses that SAPI API because of which I do not really have to have a, a classic uh, internet connected to my application. So without internet also it works. You can also use a service which is provided by Google. So you can just also invoke a Google uh, REST request and Google will uh, take this audio snippet and then converts it back to you into a text form which you can use it. Once again, there is a subscription for that, uh, for a free, uh, it's I think typically limited to about uh, 500 interactions per day, right? So stuff like that. So this is my basic uh, engine, which actually picks up the command. And then I have got another very, very simple mechanism wherein I set up my uh, engine. This particular engine will have a method called as say, and that particular say will produce the audio output to the text, right? So these are the two things which I have got and the rest of the entire thing is my service, right? What are all the services which I provide? So I just typically pick up a command from the user and then analyze what exactly are the keywords and based on the keywords, I pick up a whole bunch of actions. So this is something like a simple command dispatcher, a command processor or whatever you say. So this is a very simple. I've just put up a bunch of actions. So let me quickly uh, run this. I'll take about two to three minutes to show you some sort of an interactions on uh, Python, right? So I'm using uh, idle. Uh, you can just use any IDE. I, this is basically absolute uh, nuts and bolts type of an implementation, very low level implementation. Welcome user. Please wait a second as I configure. Good afternoon, sir. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. Can you tell me the time now? Current time is 12 11 p.m. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. What is the date today? Sorry, this is rubbish. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. Who is Ratan Tata? Ratan Naval Tata, born December 28, 1937, is an Indian industrialist, philanthropist, and a former chairman of Tata Sons. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. Please tell me the balance in my account. I can get your bank balance. A minute, please. Tell me your account number. 200. Balance in your account is 100,000. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. I want to listen to music. I can play music stored on your computer. Which music you wish to listen? Soft or rock? Soft music. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. Can I write a note? I wish to write a note. What should I write, sir? Python is a wonderful programming language, simple, sweet, and easy to learn. And especially Python should be taught at the college level right in the first year. Sir, should I include date and time? Yes, please. I am Anita, your voice assistant. Now ready. 
कैन यू लुक एट बरोडा लोकेट बरोडा लोकेटिंग योर प्लेस आई एम अनिता योर वॉइस असिस्टेंट नाउ रेडी बाय अनिता प्लीज से द कमांड अगेन आई एम अनिता योर वॉइस असिस्टेंट नाउ रेडी बाय okay so that was a very very simple uh, uh a demo i did not take much of a time even to develop that but uh, the uh, focus is on the fact that you know voice can be used to trigger a whole bunch of activities and uh, services i could uh, bring in a bunch of applications to run or i could just bring in some sort of a services which are collaborative and i could also use it to take some dictation so let us see whether the dictation got created properly or not yeah my note.txt is created so let me see that fine so it did not do a very very good job instead of python it took it as mitron mitron is a wonderful programming language simple sweet and easy to learn and especially uh, it should be as come down to icon should be taught at the college level right in the first year right got converted to w r i t e very simply because you know uh, i am not really putting this entire information into any nlp engine please understand this this is only capturing the sentential forms uh, and it is just produced some form of a text output i need to pass this on to a, a natural language processing engine so that i can perform all these sort of corrections understand the context make the appropriate changes and uh, do a whole bunch of activities related to my nlp okay so uh, i think i have got another 20 minutes uh, i will just continue with the uh, topic here and this was just to introduce to the fact that you know virtual assistants is uh, not a big deal uh, you can just pick it up and then get started and to this whatever i have done you can just add up a bunch of Uh, ai elements and then machine learning uh, elements you can just bring in even scikit learn from uh, the bottom up and then you can just create a small appliance right and uh, the best part is this entire appliance you can put it onto an r pi as well a raspberry pi right so all you require is a bunch of additional drivers the microphone driver the audio driver as we call it and the speaker driver for your raspberry pi once you get that the same code works like a charm also on the raspberry pi right so it is not possible for you to create maybe you know voice assisted kiosking type of an application you have a vending machine you really don't have to go and then press any button to the vending machine you directly go and talk to the vending machine it will dispense coffee or tea or whatever you want you know you can give you clear instructions how you want your coffee you want your coffee strong light half cup full cup you know etc you can just give this sort of uh, natural language interfaces rather than just clicking in some sort of buttons out there okay so uh, i'm getting on to a very brief discussion on uh, 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 almond so i just put up a small disclaimer here all the slides which i'm going to talk out over here are obtained and extracted from a few authors books and presentations and uh, typically publications which are available on the uh, open net uh, and uh, i gracefully acknowledge the contribution to all these uh, people right uh, having said that i'm just uh, using these only for information purposes and educational purposes So let us talk about almond in a nutshell. Uh, I don't think we should be talking about almonds and nuts, uh, and this specifically not this sort of nuts. We will talk about almonds in an almond shell, right? Very very brief introduction to almonds in an almond shell. So what is this almond? It is a virtual assistant which is programmable and it's supposed to be privacy protecting. We will see why it is called as privacy protecting. Secondly, it is a uh, still in the development stage but shows lot of promise that's the reason why you know i just got 
hooked up onto this uh, uh, Almin as a tool, as a service, as a learning experience, a learning area, and so on and so forth. And it is uh, highly suitable for even small footprint IoT devices. It does not really work so very well on Raspberry Pi 3. Uh, it hangs. Even on Raspberry 5 also, the porting is a little difficult. The porting that is available is through a Docker. So you require to set up Docker also onto your Raspberry 4. So you essentially require at least a 4 gigs or an 8 gig version of a Raspberry Pi. Then, you know, then Almond can do a decent job. Uh, it's a little sluggish. So you really cannot use it in uh, the context of real-time interactions, right? What are the basic uh, components which make up ALG? Uh, Thinkpedia and ThinkTalk are the two basic technologies which are driven by a backend engine called as a Genie. Genie is the neural network supporting engine which actually generates a whole bunch of uh, test cases to train the neural networks. So we'll talk about each of these components. So functionally, if you look at uh, Almond, it has got these uh, four blocks, right? Uh, major blocks happen to be what we call as a Thinkpedia. Like you have got a Wikipedia. Thinkpedia is uh, essentially a repository of all the devices and the services offered by each and every device. So it's something like a, 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 a subscribable type of a repository of all the devices, right? Please understand when I say device, it is a point from where I can actually trigger a service, right? It could be a hard device or it could be a soft device, right? Genie is a AI based or neural network based generator for training data. Now, the worst part about normal uh, speech based application is you require large corpus of training data. Big companies like Google's, they uh, generate trillions and trillions of uh, training data sets so that you know, the entire speech recognition process uh, comes up with an accuracy as they report something leading towards 97 and 98 percentage. Now, that sort of a corpus of uh, natural language dialogues, if at all I have to store, I typically require very heavy infrastructure. Right? I require very, very heavy infrastructure. I normally tend to set it up uh, in the cloud. And the moment I set it up in the cloud, not only my voice is my uh, information, everything actually gets uh, out of my environment. So what uh, Stanford has thought about is they talk about privacy protecting architecture. And this is the place where they talk about using a very small bunch of sentences, the training sentences. And from this, they try to mix match, they try to regenerate a large corpus of uh, training data, which I can use it to train my neural network here itself. Okay, so that is the uh, way Genie actually <laughs> works. And you also have got another component called the LUI net, the linguistic user interface network. That is also a neural network. We, if time permits, we'll also talk about that a little later on. <clears throat> And the entire interactions and the intercommunications and the exchanges is not very simple normal SOAP messages or JSON messages. Uh, they have defined a very simple uh, programming language. Uh, even Alexa has their own uh, markup language. Similarly, uh, these people have defined a very simple uh, script-like language called as ThinkTalk. So the entire interconnection interactions will be based out on uh, ThinkTalk. So what does this uh, essentially mean? Uh, Almond takes a user's natural language inputs and generates as an output a ThinkTalk program. And this becomes a small script and that gets executed by any other service. So quickly, let's talk about Thinkpedia. I told you Thinkpedia is an open repository of all the skills used by Almond. By skills, we mean all the services which are used by Almond. And the moment I expose these services, I now say my Almond is a little more skilled it is learned a little more about how to talk to these devices and how to talk to these sort of services, right? That is what my Thinkpedia is. It's very much like your Wikipedia, but Wikipedia is about general information. Thinkpedia is all about things. So what is this? Uh, it gets in, it has information about all the devices. For example, like you have a light bulb or a thermostat or an AC appliance or a pump or a motor or a lathe machine, or probably also as a 
Twitter as a service, you know, all these are essentially identified as devices. So how is this devices? Devices is uh, organized in the form of a classes. Uh, so you have a class and the class gives you a template of a generic behavior of a, a category of uh, devices. And that also exposes now to a rich set of services which I can run on those particular category of devices. Now, having said that, what does the device profile contain? The device profile contains information which is in the form of a namespace and category, subcategory and all that. So you have profiles and the profiles once again can be inherited. So for example, like you have got an alarm profile. So on an alarm profile, you can typically perform a bunch of services. You know, you can uh, uh, read the alarm status, you can set an alarm status, you know, trigger an alarm status on a particular time or on a particular event, generate an alarm, you can specify all that. And if at all I've got uh, devices which are like fire alarm and fire alarm can be a child class of your alarm, the same profile gets extended to a fire alarm. Fire alarm. alarm. Are Five minutes warning. Yes, sir. Yeah. Five. Yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll run. Run. So essentially you've got these sort of uh, device profiles. They are got static profiles and state profiles and service list. Uh, profiles for authorization, profile uh, information which stores all the discovery services, how do you identify this device and so on and so forth and all that. You know, all this is bundled into Thingspedia as a device profile. And uh, it uh, can uh, handle queries and uh, generate some actions. You know, queries are uh, wherein you can uh, essentially have something like a getter setter type of a method and action will perform some actions. Okay. so. When you talk about think tank, think talk, sorry, think talk is a programming language, which is like a rule based programming language. So let me quickly show you how this uh, thing looks like. So this is a very typical definition of a device, uh, which is reporting to you a weather information. So weather information has got a token class representation, which talks about uh, whether you can query this or not. You can just give information, which is an input in the form of a location. And it generates a whole bunch of outputs, like you know the temperature, the wind speed, the humidity, uh, whether it is cloudiness or not, fog is there or not, and so on and so forth. Right? And you can use these sort of uh, methods over this particular object or a device. So I say uh, org.thinkpedia.weather.current and set up a location by passing in a new location. And then I can also query, right? I can just say get, get is a simple method which tells me what exactly is the current state of that particular object in the context of location equals to fallout. So I cannot just execute this until and unless I'm tagged this service to a service provider. So I require a service provider to offer me these sort of services who can report to me this weather information. So this is how it actually goes across. For example, I can use this sort of a natural language command and this natural language command gets converted into a think talk uh, script. And this particular think talk script is what is uh, the semantic structure. Uh, it gives you a nice rule based mechanism to process this rule, trigger an action. Okay, so the entire operations are based out on very simple constructs like, you know, when, get, do, right? When is an event detected, get is to obtain the current status and do is to perform an action. Obviously, in the process, you can also set up a few filters. So I've given a bunch of uh, loose English uh, statements which are parsed and then we understand what exactly is the underlying context in the uh, uh, aspect of think talk. So I told you, you have got LUI net. Uh, LUI net is a neural network which is actually powering Almond and uh, it essentially executes a bunch of IFTTT rules. If this, then that type of a rule. It's basically a simple rule-based uh, implementation. And the best part is uh, as of now, LUI, LUI net is only tailored for English. And uh, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to translate uh, uh, this LUI net, you just have to add up these language models out there so that you can use this for most of our Indic languages as well. And as a background, it uses LSTM or by LSTM, I should say, bidirectional LSTM model. And that is once again a part of a recurrent neural network, an extension of a recurrent neural network, which is 
essentially based out on the context. Uh, there is a concept of security. Security is typically handled not at the central server, but by the Almond assistant itself. So for any interaction which is outside of the domain, any interaction that comes up as a request, it first uh, checks out a policy database to identify whether this particular request can be executed. And uh, depending upon the policy, if there is a global policy that is defined, the request gets executed. If not, it reaches to the owner of the service and then gets a, a appropriate permission in real time. And if it is approved, then only uh, maybe the policy database gets updated or otherwise it could be only for that particular current uh, action and the action would be performed, right? So security is not going outside of your premise. That is the reason why they say that this is security preserving or in a privacy preserving uh, application. Uh, when you come down to element devices, there are almost about 80 different classes or profiles for IoT devices, application services, social media services, and a large number of uh, external services which need to be integrated. And uh, you have about 174 plus services which are already exposed. So you can just call them through a API and you can use these sort of services. So you can also set up element for uh, RPI. You can just uh, download from GitHub a Docker image and then you know set it up onto your RPI and then the server automatically gets started on port uh, 3000. So you can just navigate to that and then you have to do a small configuration in terms of your namespaces. So you have to configure how your home automation system is treating the appliances. Uh, the home automation system knows what is meant by bed light uh, what exactly is a hardware port and your element will have to now give out a command uh, to the home automation system, which is in the context of a bed light. Now, for example, I speak, uh, shut down all the lights. So it has to now go through an iterative mechanism of uh, triggering uh, shut down bedroom light, shut down kitchen light, shut down the living room light and so on and so forth, something like that, right? So it also, you also have to set up your TTS platform you also have to set up your M MQTT broker and yeah, some sort of a small setup is required. You also have got this sort of automated setup tools and that's how uh, RPI can also be uh, integrated along with an existing home uh, appliance, right? Or home appliance, or I can just say a home gateway or whatever. Okay, so Almond can also uh, create new automation, as I told you. So it, these are rules are not very simple rules. These rules are reasonably complex. So when I leave home means what I need to also understand my location and these location services have to be integrated with the additional services of uh, uh, triggering the appliances within my home, right? So stuff like that, you know, you can just uh, integrate a whole bunch of this. And for that Almond provides a nice, beautiful rule editor. So you can define uh, these uh, rules and then you can set it up in Almond. So these uh, becomes typically the trigger points for Almond. The downside, this is I think the last slide. Almond is still not yet stable, but I think it is going to show very good promise. Uh, it's not in a commercial grade type of a platform. The big four are uh, uh, throttling Almond. That's one thing, but uh, it uh, is good and it can be very easily implemented as a very simple, low cost, cost-effective solution for a place like India. And RPI with 4GB elements still works, but with a lot of lag. So it cannot be really used in real time uh, uh, applications, number two. And number three is integration with other devices is not completely simple and straightforward, especially if at all we want to use it in the context of an IIoT environment, uh, integration and stability is not completely proven. So that is something which people I think are working out. Maybe in the couple of years to come, uh, this uh, product will stabilize and then we can just uh, deploy this uh, into an industrial environment like IoT gateways and smart IoT gateways can now also be voice uh, enabled. Okay, so these are small applications where you can use uh, Almond for uh, the education uh, segment, like you can just set up an interactive Viva, or you can just set up interactive interviews. Um, you can just use this as book readers, which are already there, or you can use this uh, in the uh, manufacturing segments for operator training. 
uh, right? And then the best part is this operator training is purely natural in uh, its interaction, not predefined spoken sentences. Or you can also use this as a HMI tool in automation. Most of the HMI tools in automation are based out on English and based out on some sort of a touch points on the keypads. Whereas now this is something where you can bring in HMI, which is purely right, spoken uh, uh, interfaces. So the lathe machine can talk to the operator. Okay, stuff like that. So that uh, concludes my talk. So in case yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I'm here. Can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, fantastic presentation. Uh, it was very exhaustive. So let me ask uh, Manu, do you have any questions? Are you there? Okay. Um, no, 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 yeah. no, 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 no. Okay. So I will go ahead with one question, one or two questions uh, before we close. The first question is. If you want to apply this to India, uh, how would some of the faculty who have been listening to this and they are interested in doing something reach you to be able to collaborate? Uh, see, you, you can reach me or you can directly uh, register yourself onto uh, uh, almond.sanford.edu and then you can become a small contributor. There are a lot of opportunities to work in Almond. Uh, Indic implementation of Almond is a very, very big opportunity, number one. Number two, writing down a whole bunch of device uh, definitions in the context of whatever is your domain. Another very good opportunity. Third one is uh, trying to use this uh, in applications low cost, but it's high bandwidth, uh, high uh, penetration type of thing. Now, just imagine we can probably bring it down into a mobile implementation. Uh, Almond is also available on IoT. And just implement this into a small device. And the device could be a 500 rupee device. It becomes a small connection point to kids. Now, what is the basic problem to understand? A lot of schools and colleges are going on for a virtual mode of instruction. And uh, invariably, a lot of girls have got only one mobile phone. And that particular mobile phone is blocked by one child in the entire day. And the other child has to fight out for that mobile time. Right? So this is something where you can now bring up a small device. This particular device would be an interaction device. Obviously, there will not be any uh, video. Maybe you can just bring it up also a little later. And that gives you a wonderful context where the 500 rupee device can be used directly uh, to, to talk to people who are in the, uh, what do you call, learning and the learner type of uh, environment. Teach the teacher, uh, teach and the totter and taught and the teacher type of environment. Right? Okay. So uh, that brings to another, how do you think that Indic language people, if they really start developing, how will you harden it and make it reliable? Is there any uh, proposal you want to push proposal, or propose? Proposals are there in the waiting, but they are still not uh, uh, done. There are some uh, activities which are going on in bits and pieces. Uh, the problem is to transliteration. There's a good amount of work that is available from the Indic languages. But that is only part of the is not what we are talking about. We are talking in yeah. terms of a generation of a whole series of uh, uh, Indic language sentential forms which can be used to train our neural network. So that is the crux that needs to be addressed. One thing I want to add here, Gokhale, um, I used to work at this company called Nuance for speech recognition and it was for doctors to like dictate and then it'll get transferred into text for like patient reports. Correct. We used to achieve like 96% accuracy by a simple trick. Let's say your commands are turn off lights, going away on vacation, etc. It's a very small corpus of um, text or speech that we need to do. If each person just trains a few such phrases, the recognition can enormously you are very right man uh, i also have uh, used uh, uans uh, i did a lot of programming on uans that was way back almost about uh, eight, 10 years back itself uh, i have i knew uans for so 
and uh, the uh, aspect of uh, usage of a solution like almond uh, is once again context uh, dependent subject dependent matter dependent. once again require a subject matter expert to clearly identify the purpose right the language purpose is very very important so you require a language expert you also require expert who can typically talk about pronunciation you talk about grammar you talk about the variations in the uh, type of uh, sentiment uh, related words variations in the context of the slang which are normally adopted even if you take hindi there are at least something like 45 different variations of hindi yeah i remember with nuance we had english and english plus hindi but absolutely true the corpus has to be limited and we got 96% accuracies when we did things like radiology or you know like very limited pathology radiology yeah, yeah. Like you have to, yeah. on, you have to use a lot of things like ontology is one of the way uh, do we have ontology for indic language the answer is a big, big. <laughs> right So, uh, actually, you have to work out from multiple angles. It's not just only setting up your language and your neural networks. There is no ontology in language, is it? So you have you have uh, uh, ontology for Indian languages. Each state can pick up one, ah. and that will be a fantastic project in itself. Multiple projects to yeah. come. No, I'm not joking. This is there are multiple yeah. opportunities available, especially in voice. You know, but uh, <laughs> voice really requires not just only programming skills; uh, require multiple skills. <laughs> yeah, true, true. That is, speech recognition has its own, speech to text has its own. Then you got neural networks. So you have generation and then dialogue. You you, you went through it. So. We, we, our faculty audience will understand that there is more to it, but uh, building uh, one piece at a time, ontology per state, can actually at least aid us in keeping the open source uh, live and cost low. Uh, with a bit of reliability, this can be launched as a product for Indian market uh, on an open source basis. That was I was thinking, but of course there are also people who can make money out of it. Welcome. Uh, all entrepreneurs uh, who this people generate because students really are more entrepreneurial. So at this time, I think we should uh, bring this to conclusion. We are ten uh, minutes past, uh, and uh, I would like to uh, thank uh, my colleague in all my past and current uh, Open Technology Foundation as well, uh, Professor Gokhale, as we call him, and. Uh, Malin, thank for sticking out till the end to support because I was thinking today is AI day and it has turned out to be really very good with uh, young generation uh, Vivek coming in in between. So I think uh, we covered uh, IoT uh, plus the AI platform very clearly, uh, giving practical examples. And once again, thanks. Uh, Gokhale, under all the circumstances, I don't know where you are today. Bombay or Delhi? I don't know. Are you in Bombay, Delhi? You are in Bombay. Okay, you are back to your base. That's glad to hear. Yesterday he was in Delhi, and we were not sure where he is going to be tomorrow. So under the circumstances, we have completed, and this was our last. Uh, uh, one more uh, recording is there, which I think uh, Prem is going to do on the 5G orchestration, which is the. Uh, super blueprint which has come in the linux foundation which we will be recording and uh, releasing along with this three today so this day 14 has three and probably we will put it in the day 15 a uh, few more which were missed previously and that is how we will close it and tomorrow will be the last uh, which will be handled by vipin uh, vipin could not uh, come today he has gone out and therefore he left it to me all the thing so at this time i am going to close the record and stop the record thank you very much thank you thank you i'm signing off thank you very much okay bye gokhale bye thank prakash you so thank you so much man bye bye gokhale are you are you speaking something
no no i'm just uh, shutting off yeah. so so we'll uh, uh, log off now uh, malni has also left vivek has left and the streaming also we we'll have to end now once i end in the stream and recordings we will split it and put it in a day or two okay thanks a lot thanks everyone uh, faculty uh members and all uh, we appreciate your time and uh, suddenly uh, we did overrun by 15 minutes but that was intended to make sure that we close it properly okay thanks a lot and have a wonderful day thanks. bye